Six o'clock, and I will call um, our regularly scheduled board meeting to order and um, ask us all to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, could I get a motion to adopt the agenda if there are no changes? Second? Second, Westbrook. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Uh, we have three minutes for approval. I'd like to group them together. Um, item 1.4, 0.5, and 0.6. Um, do I have a motion to approve? I move, Alfred. Thank you, second? Second, Boardman. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Dr. Hubbard, can you lead us off on the superintendent's report? Absolutely. I'm happy to begin tonight's superintendent report by inviting Kim Hinkle, executive director of the Shawnee Mission Education Foundation, to share some exciting announcements with all of us. Oh, that's impressive. <laughs> there, okay, we're going to start again. Um, good evening, Dr. Sinclair, Dr. Hubbard, and members of the Board of Education. Thank you so much for wel welcoming us this evening. I'm Cindy Neely, the chair of the program committee for the Shawnee Mission Education Foundation Board of Directors. And joining me is Board Vice President Ken Schaefer and Executive Director Kim Hinkle. Tonight we're here to celebrate the teachers and administrators who are receiving an Excellence in Education grant from the Shawnee Mission Education Foundation. Later in the agenda, you will have the opportunity to approve the donation that will make these projects possible. And I respectfully request that you consider doing so. Now I'd like to ask Kim to tell you a little bit about these incredible projects. Kim? Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Board of Education, for allowing us to be here tonight. So we have some really exciting projects. There's a lot, so I'm going to go fast. Um, and I'll ask that we hold all of our applause, which I know we'll want a lot of, um, till the end. So we're going to start in early childhood education, where speech-language pathologists Le uh, Lisa Burgesson and Emily Rose Patrick are receiving augmentative and alternative communication tools to help our littlest learners who struggle with language or who are learning two languages. We also have Sarah Behrens and Rebecca Blizzard at our Early Childhood Center who are also receiving a mobile library card and lots and lots of books to get them started. You know, we're big fans of books here at the Foundation. Uh, next, we'll go to some really innovative STEM activities in our elementary schools, where Meredith Little, the librarian at Apache Innovative School, uh, will introduce Lego spike kits to the entire school. Um, Amanda Fleege and Samantha Hale at Benninghoven will bring Ozobots to all grade levels. And Roderick Gaeta at Corinth Elementary will be working with sixth graders to design remote um, operated vehicles, which we're very excited about. Um, as you know, um, uh, we are excited to help Abby Kepka at Neiman Elementary bring some new high-interest books to the school library. Bernadette Roche at Pawnee Elementary um, is bringing some combination print and audio books to the library. And Danielle Crumey at Rose Hill is bringing culturally responsive literature to their diverse student population. Uh, we are also, um, we're so pleased that the grants at Pawnee and Rose Hill are being supported by the Diana Lane Hughes Forever Friends Fund um, and honoring her legacy by encouraging our students to read. So we're really excited about that and our donors um, for that fund are here. Um, uh, uh, Warren and Linda Diefenbach left, but they were here earlier and are quite enthusiastic. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> okay, so knowing the importance of social and emotional learning, we are honored to help Kendra Greenwood at Broken Arrow Elementary and Tommy Hitt at Arrowhead Day Program bring important sensory tools that help students with their emotional self-regulation. And next we're on to middle school. We got elementary done, okay. Uh, middle school where Allison Lever at Westridge is spearheading a school garden that will teach kids about science and provide food for their community. We also want to congratulate Margaret Thompson and Kelsey Phillips who are middle school art teachers. They actually wrote grants on behalf of every middle school in the district um, to secure Apple pens because our middle schools have a new class called the Art of Animation and uh, these pens will help all of our students taking that class. So we're excited to bring that to every middle school. Um, and I am also pleased that the Jack Challenger Legacy Fund, um, which is housed um, or which is supported by our friends at Main Street Credit Union, um, is supporting that grant along with funds given in memory of Serene Borderching. So uh, those middle school pens are gonna be really exciting for our animation students. Okay, we're moving on to high school now. We're, we're going right along. So next up, we are uh, congratulating Britt Shear at North and Taylor Smith at South who are expanding their women in leadership programs. And then uh, some more books. Uh, every year we have, uh, for the past several years, we've supported Project Lit, which is a great collaboration between Rebecca Anthony at Northwest, Ann Stowers at West, and Julie Fales at South. Um, so really high interest literature getting into the hands of our students and they are reading for fun. So we love that. Um, and then last but definitely not least is our post high students um, and we want to congratulate um, Amy Quinley and all of our student interns in our project search uh, program at Advent Health. They, um, these students are going to be certified in first aid and CPR so we're really excited to support that. So uh, thank you again to the Board of Education for allowing us to be here and thanks to our amazing educators who are so innovative and inspire us all every day. So thank you. Thank you, Kim, for your presentation and thanks to the Shawnee Mission Education Foundation. And most importantly, thank you to the educators who are all receiving this grant and for all the creative ways you're innovating our schools and our classrooms. And let's not forget you all chose to come here on your day off. So <laughs> thank you all so much for being here. We are pleased to share with everyone tonight that two of our elementary schools have been recognized by the Kansas State Department of Education. Comanche and uh, Shawano Elementary Schools are recipients of Challenge Awards, which are created to honor schools that are performing well on the state assessments and have had high percentages of students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Randy Watson, Commissioner of the Kansas State Department of Education, shared that these awards are a celebration of the great work schools are doing and remind us to continue pushing forward to improve student academic performance and narrow the gap between subgroups. These schools are doing an exceptional job in these areas. We congratulate the Comanche and Shawano communities for all you have accomplished for our students. A statewide spotlight is also shining on two of our Shawnee Mission teachers who represented the best among the best. Amber Pagan, a pre-kindergarten teacher at Neiman Elementary, was named a Region 3 finalist for the 2025 Kansas Teacher of the Year program. As a finalist, she is receiving a $2,000 cash award and is in the running for the recognition of Kansas Teacher of the Year to be named at a ceremony in September. In addition, we are proud that the Kansas State Department of Education also recognized Annie Hassan, Arabic teacher at Shawnee Mission South, who represented the Shawnee Mission School District as our secondary nominee. We thank both of these educators for all the ways they shine, and since Amber's in the audience, congratulations again. The Shawnee Mission North Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps continues its long record of success. This group recently competed at the national level and earned first place in armed regulation drill, first place in push-ups, and I can't even tell you how many they did, it is so impressive, um, and first place in color guard. This national competition included 10 events, and Chief Warrant Officer and Instructor Dennis Grayless noted this team claimed either national champion or runner-up in half of the events. The Corps concludes the season with a record of 94 and 5. 
Congratulations to everyone from the Shawnee Mission North NJROTC, and we will be fe featuring them on our next podcast. The Shawnee Mission School District was recently recognized as a Founders Award recipient by the Health Partnership Clinic for its continued work to ensure greater access to health care for students across the district, including those experiencing housing insecurity and homelessness. Mr. David Armovich, McKinney Vento Liaison, and Dr. Jen Mc John McKinney, Director of Family and Student Services, were recognized at the organization's annual luncheon. We greatly appreciate and value the ongoing partnership with Health Partnership Clinic to provide a school-based health clinic for students and their siblings at Shawnee Mission West High School. A reminder, this clinic serves all Shawnee Mission students and their siblings ages 3 to 20 years old at Shawnee Mission West. Appointments may be scheduled on Thursdays from 11 to 3. HPC accepts Medicaid and private insurance and offers a sliding fee discount to uninsured individuals based on household size and income. Information is available on the district website under Health Services. It has already been an awesome spring for our signature programs, and I want to share a few highlights from these specialized programs this evening. A team of engineering students earned the opportunity to present a prototype at NASA Scientists at Johnson Space Center in Houston this month through the NASA Hunch program. Madeline Ampleman, Elena Beck, Miles Cohen, and Samuel Wilson entered their prototype design last semester and have advanced in this competition. The same team also earned a semifinalist designation for another component of the same project. Shiny Mission Animation students showcased their talent and creativity recently at the E. EMAGAN Media Festival. Shiny Mission competitors placed first or second in each of the three 2D animation categories at this event that welcomed more than 30 different high schools. Ben Gilman, a senior at Shiny Mission East, earned two awards, finishing first place in animated character and second place in 2D animation. We'll include a link in the recap outlining all they accomplished at this festival. The biotechnology program also shined at the 73rd Greater Kansas City Science and Engineering Fair. These students drew six division wins, eight special awards, two Pioneer in Science awards, and one International Science and Engineering Fair qualifier. Elizabeth Barnes, a sophomore from Shawnee Mission West, has now qualified for international competition two years in a row. We congratulate our signature program students and instructors for all of their accomplishments. I invite everyone to check out the most recent episode of Shiny Mission Miked Up. Episode 17 features Dr. Leanne Neal, Chief of Early Childhood and Sustainability, and Tina Hunsinger, a pre-kindergarten teacher at Brookridge. It's a great opportunity to learn about the power and importance of early intervention and early learning and how so many of our students begin their time in the Shiny Mission School District. We'll include a link in the recap for anyone wanting to watch, download, or subscribe. This month, we are thrilled to discover the power of poetry as we read across SMSD. Let's take a look. Hello, I'm Jessica Hembry, and I serve on the Shawnee Mission School District Board of Education. I am excited to introduce the April 2024 Read Across SMSD theme, Discover the Power of Poetry. The elementary book this month is How to Write a Poem by Newbery medalist Kwame Alexander and Deanna Nikaido. The book helps us take a look at the world and see how poetry is all around. Kwame Alexander says the purpose of the book is to show how to use your words, how to lift your voices, and how to change the world one stanza at a time. This month we are thrilled to be able to share with everyone three student honorees from this year's PTA Citizenship Writing Contest. These poets each submitted entries for a poem reflecting on the theme, I Will Lift Up Others By. Let's see how they are changing the world one stanza at a time. If someone is hurt, ask if they are okay. When someone is sad, be there. Smile and try to encourage laughter. You can do a favor or encourage to try again. Tell that they tried their best or that they deserve better than to be bullied. Or told they are bad at something. When someone is down, you can lift their spirits by showing appreciation or inspiring them can lift their spirits too. You can ask what's wrong or how is your day going, or give a gift and carry something or hold a door open. Be kind and say please and thank you. They might be happy after you do some of those. You could also invite them to a game or to read a book. 
Get to know them better than you did before, and you could say things about you, too. Give a paper and pencil another writing utensil so that they could draw. Or color or make a card yourself to make them happier. And tell them to have a good day or good night when you are done. Having citizenship is good for you and your friends. Make sure to have fun with your friends and family and be kind. My hatred for silence went away when I realized that it has stayed longer than most people have. For I used to think, better alone than sorry. But there I was, gluing back together the pages of the story I ripped known as my life. After every page was stitched, I returned to my vast, bleak mind. That is, until my eye caught upon a person with the same struggles, her book masked with tears, though her book rather short. I sat down next to the worn out girl in replacement of listening to her sobs of regret. I began crying too. She did not question, for she knew I had dealt with the same struggles before. Each time her emotion changed, mine copied. Sorrow, fear, anger, regret. Everything suddenly came to a halt as we both realized we weren't alone anymore. On that day, the black and white turned into a pool of color for we lifted each other up high to the clouds, possible due to our stepping stools, stepping stools of empathy. I can lift others up by being positive and also kind. Helping others is to me something that creates joy and peace. If someone is being pushed around or another shoves them to the ground, I will lend a helping hand and lift them up off the dirt or sand. When a friend does not feel well or if someone else don't feel too swell, I can make some soup or food to help them through their sick-like mood. When I see a friend break into tears and they are ignored by their peers, I will try to cheer them up and give them joy to fill their cup. When someone else puts up their guard or pushes themselves a bit too hard, I will help them so they try, seeing there is a brighter side. Whether it is a friend or a foe, I will want to help them so they will go and they will say, the world is a place they want to stay. Thank you all so much for sharing your poetry with us. Thank you also to the educators, family members, and especially our PTA and SMAC PTA members who inspired poets and writers in SMSD. Let's all take time this month to listen, write, and discover the power of poetry. Let's read across SMSD. Thank you, Jessica Embry, for being our narrator of the um, video this month. And our poets, and always to NEA Shawnee Mission for their ongoing partnership, and the Shawnee Mission Education Foundation for providing access to read across books to all of our students in the Shawnee Mission School District. Next week will be an exciting one in the Shawnee Mission School District as we host the 62nd Annual Research and Development Forum. This is a district-wide celebration of student innovation and achievement, and our entire community is invited to see many ways our students shine. From 4 to 7 p.m. on April 23rd, 24th, and 25th, the district will host student showcase open houses at the Center for Academic Achievement. Attendees will be able to see student work in art, science, and career and technical education, as well as see student musical performances and live demonstrations. On Saturday, April 27th from 9 to 11.30 a.m., we will host the next Great Idea Pitch Competition. Anyone can view a live stream on smsd.org or attend the event in person at the Center for Academic Achievement. We will also host an awards ceremony at 2 p.m. A quick thank you to the Rainier family who have supported the R&D Forum throughout its entirety in the Shawnee Mission School District, and thank you to all of um, the others who make this event possible. I want to offer a brief update this evening regarding the Strategic Plan Cycle 2 process. Most recently, action teams uh, met and have taken place here at the Center for Academic Achievement. These action teams are meeting with the purpose of developing action plans for all of the six drafted strategies of the updated plan developed by the steering committee. These members include community volunteers, Shawnee Mission uh, leadership team members, certified and classified staff, students, and parents. The teams have been highly engaged in discussions to develop the next steps to move the plan forward. The action teams will present their work to the steering committee on, the, on June 6th 
We expect a finalized draft of the updated strategic plan that will serve us from 2024 to 2029 to be presented to the board for their consideration on June 24th. We thank everyone who has provided input and their time contributing to this process. And now I would like to invite Steve Lowe, Principal at Shawnee Mission West, to introduce our first All-Star of the evening. Good evening. It's my honor to introduce Ms. Patty Hayes. This intro must go no longer than one minute, but for those who know Patty, know that's 60 seconds longer than she feels comfortable with. Ms. Hayes does not like attention drawn to her, not even positive recognition. In fact, when we told her she was being recognized as a district all-star, she pretty much said, do I have to? And that's not to belittle the recognition at all, and it's not false modesty. Ms. Hayes is genuinely humble. Everything about Ms. Hayes is authentic, and selfless. She has a true servant leadership heart. This is why she is able to connect and positively impact the students she supports. This is why she's an all-star. Patty, that was 40 seconds. <laughs> Patty goes above and beyond for, um, for everyone. Um, she's caring, she's kind, and she just has this way of knowing what needs to happen next and just making it happen. Um, and I wouldn't want to work with anyone else. For me, she's like the greatest person ever. She has like, she brings such good energy to school and to all her students and she cares so much about everybody around her. Patty is wonderful. If there's a problem, she doesn't hesitate. She will jump right in. She will maybe even have a solution figured out before I get there. She's just a really good person to be around. Um, there's not a good day without Patty. She makes a lot of good memories and just likes to have fun. So. She just has a natural inclination to build positive rapport and she knows how to provide them with those high expectations and boundaries, but they know she cares. She always makes sure that everybody that comes in, that comes in like having a rough time, she always makes sure that they leave willing to go to class, happy and, you know, cooled down from the situation. She is a staple in this school um, and, and we could not function here in this building without all of her efforts. Congratulations, Coach. You deserve everything. You're one of the best people in the world and no one deserves it more than you. Congratulations, Patty. There's no one who deserves it more than you. Congratulations. I'm so excited for you. You deserve this. It's really awesome. You really deserve it, even though you might think that. Um, but yeah, good job. <laughs> You're always willing to make sure that I'm having a good time in a good environment here at Shawnee Mission West, and thank you. Congratulations, but most of all, thank you for everything you do for our students here at West. Thank you for everything you do, not just in the classroom and not just with some of our students who face some challenging behaviors, but for everything you do outside the classroom and on the softball field and building young citizens for the future. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you guys so much. I love what I do at West, and um, the kids have been teasing me all week to get everything, to get it together, and that um, this has been the most humbling experience to just sit back and let loose and um, accept the praise from everyone, and so I appreciate everything, and I appreciate my Mr. Lowe, so thank you. Congratulations, Patty. And now I would like to invite Lacey Warren from Indian Woods Middle School to present our next All-Star. Good evening. We are so excited to have Miss Rebecca Donahue um, honored tonight for our All-Star Award. Rebecca goes above and beyond. She's a part of our fine arts department at Indian Woods, and um, she is just an integral part of 
the department and the building. Um, and I could say a thousand of words about her. However, I'm going to let our students talk about her because they are the ones that have nominated her and they truly love everything she does for our choir department at Indian Woods. I think if you're ever at Indian Woods, you have to visit her classroom. The energy and passion that the students have, that she has, it just, it makes your heart smile every single day. Um, and it makes you just want to be a part of this building and community in her classes. This is definitely my favorite hour. You can ask any of my friends and they'll all say this is Carly's favorite class of the day. Like I'm so more like energetic and lively and I talk to so many new people. It's all because of her. I've learned so much confidence in myself and like other people that I've learned to just go out there and try it. Like, okay, so you never know. You can always try new things. She always tries to incorporate music and learning into games that would make it more enjoyable. And she always just tries really hard to make this class something to look forward to and something to enjoy. She kind of has that comfort level with the students that makes teaching an art, not a science. She's always a voice of grace and poise and she always comes from the perspective of let's put the students experience first. Yes! Did you guys hear that clip there? She lets people like um, kind of be their own person she really lets people like speak their mind, have their own opinion, and considers it. And like, she treats people like we are um, equals. Rebecca, it is such a blessing to be your friend, to be your colleague and your coworker. Congratulations on your outstanding award. Thank you for being one of the, not one of the best teacher at the school. You're kind, you're caring, you're loving, and I love you personally a lot. You mean a lot to me, so yeah, you're the best. Good evening, board. I am so honored to be recognized as this month's Johnny Mission All-Star. Even more so, I am really humbled by all the compliments and comments in that beautiful video. I would like to thank the Board of Education for your continued support of the performing arts programs in the district, as well as my administrators for their unwavering support of my program. My family is here tonight, some of my work colleagues are here tonight, and I am so grateful to them for all their help behind the scenes. Most of all, I would like to thank the students who nominated me. That they would take the time to want to honor me is probably the most meaningful part of this whole evening. Ultimately, those students featured in the video, all those students in my choir this year, and the hundreds of students I've had the pleasure to teach during my career at Rising Star in Indian Woods are why I do this job and why I love it so much. Thank you all so much. Very much. Thank you. Congratulations, Rebecca. And that concludes the superintendent report. Thank you. Um, all right, item 2.2, the board reports. Um, we'll start with the um, SMAC PTA, Mr. Garcia. Yeah, thank you. Was able to sit down with uh, SMAC PTA folks um, about a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was great to get to chat with them. We were talking about the PTA boards across the district that are transitioning right now from uh, in their leadership roles um, and just kind of understanding that process just from an outside perspective learning about it was was pretty significant to me and really grateful and wanted to give a shout out to those parents who are now in leadership roles across the district and those PTAs. Um, we had a pretty candid conversation about what it looks like for Folks in our community get more involved in those PTAs. We know those are so significant to our school communities, facilitating programs and experiences for our students, families, teachers. Um, but we just chatted about how um, it's important and that we're seeing a, a lack here and there and wanting to address those and trying to figure out some ways to, to do so. So definitely excited for the future, working with them to address some of those uh, concerns and issues because we want to maintain a, the strength behind those PTAs in our buildings. Um, so yeah, that's all I have from, from there. 
Thank you. And I think SMAC PTA hosted the state convention yeah. um, along with the district here. I was here for a little bit of that Saturday. It was a very engaging event. Yeah. It was very fun. Thank you. I think our Mr. Smith gave a keynote kicked off in the morning. So thank you for that as well. Um, okay, back to you, Mr. Garcia, for a Education Foundation. Was able to finally, <laughs> yeah, sit down with them for the first time um, uh, last week or also a couple weeks ago. Congratulations. Just wanted to reiterate uh, the grant recipients tonight. Um, nothing too much uh, coming from there. Was glad to see them all here and more to come sitting down with them in the future. All right. Thank you. Ms. Borgman. Yeah. KSB Board of Directors. I have been looking forward to um, sharing an update with my fellow board members. We were in Council Grove this past weekend for a KSB Board of Directors meeting, um, and it was just phenomenal. It was my first meeting as part of the Board of Directors, and what an amazing group. A um, couple things I wanted to pass along. First and foremost, I'll just kind of give you some highlights of the meeting. Um, it started off with we just you know, got an update regarding what has happened in the legislature this uh, past session. And so um, I think there may be more to come on that, <laughs> always, right? And um, then we talked about just kind of a review of what KSB did, everything, what they did this past um, year. So it was kind of a review to get everybody a little bit up to speed. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, what was happening, what's happening in districts across the, the um, state um, with some issues being not unique to any one district and things like SPED, chronic, t chronic absenteeism, teacher retention, um, declining enrollment, four-day school work, four-day school week, um, and teacher flexibility, just different things like that were issues that we all kind of brainstormed and, and talked about amongst each other. Um, some other things I wanted to share with you is there is a phenomenal resource on the KASB website. It's KASB Plus. So it's just a really great content center. So if you want to um, learn more about a specific issue, or if you are just curious as to um, just different things that KSB does, for example, we can each go into the KSB Plus and learn, watch videos or just there's different downloads of PDFs and stuff that, again, it's a great educational resource for us as board members. Um, and then another just thing that they are, um, you know, they have phenomenal attorneys on staff that are, um, free for us as board members. And so, you know, if you ever want to reach out to them about an issue or just if you have a question about something, um, again, they are always there for us as just a phenomenal resource. And I know during COVID, I reached out to them a couple times and was really thankful for just kind of a third party sort of perspective on things. So um, for you no, new board members, especially, I, I highly recommend that you sort of keep that in mind um, as, as we navigate, you know, some tricky things at some point. So that's kind of it. It just was a really great group of people. And I'm really thankful for KSB advocating for our kids. Um, we, we did some good things this past session. And um, I think in large part, it's because of the advocacy and just the willingness that they have to partner with just people, you know, regardless of party affiliation and um, just really have kids' best interest at heart. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you for that update and for road tripping. That's great. Um, Ms. Owsley, update on legislative, KSB Legislative Committee. Well, the Legislative Committee um, is not meeting right now because we put together our policy provisions at the beginning of session and we're at the end of session. Um, and Dr. Little, I believe, was going to submit a written report for the board um, kind of on where things are at right now. Um, the Education Conference Committee met on April 6th and put out something that they agreed upon in principle, but I have not read, and I'm not even sure that the written document is available for reading yet, um, but I do believe, it's my understanding, that a lot of the policy provisions that we were concerned with um, and that KASB was concerned with um, as advocacy groups are no longer in the bill. Um, and there is 
roughly like $75 million more for special education. Um, and while they are going to require that LOB funds are mandated towards SPED, it, they are not rewriting LOB and routing it through the state as they had initially proposed. So um, the amount of funds that they would mandate going towards SPED is money that we would okay. have already putting towards SPED. So it doesn't have an impact on our practice, but the new funds will. So that is really good news. Thank you for that update. Um, okay, let's see. Um, policy review committee, do you all meet or we, that was, uh, you, right, where next meeting is? We met a few weeks ago and there are second reads tonight for right. the policies that were presented on the first reads at our last meeting. So we have an opportunity to vote on those in our action items this evening. Thank you. All right, finance and facilities committee, um, our next meeting is May 2nd. And I believe after that meeting, we can stay for the R&D forum. I think it's the same night. Um, all right, real world learning um, team. I don't know if there have been any events we don't, tomorrow, David? No report. Okay. We really don't have an update. Okay, all right. I believe that concludes our board reports. Thank you. Um, item 2.3, board finance report. So attached, you'll find the board report and the SR3 report um, ending March 2024. Um, Russ is going to give, obviously, a more updated uh, budget workshop here shortly in the discussion items. But if you have any questions on either of these reports, we will entertain those. Not seeing any at this moment. OK. All right. Uh, that brings us to our consent items. We have from items. Discussion oh, items. Discu oh, yeah, there's a few discussion <laughs> items. <laughs> Three major reports. So sorry. So sorry. Thank you. Um, item 3.1, uh, food service program update 2023-24. Yes. Hubbard. Sorry yeah. about that. That's okay. Grace, you were just about off the hook, my friend. I know, right? <laughs> Skipping right on down. All right. Grace Liss is uh, Director of Food Service. She'll be providing our update. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard, Dr. Sinclair, and the board for allowing me to come once again to give you an update on food service. Um, the food service department is committed to the district's mission by educating students on nutrition every time we prepare and serve a meal. Food service is committed to providing affordable, high quality, freshly prepared, nutritious food and personalized service to our customers. We believe the beliefs, mission, parameters, and object objectives outlined in the district's strategic plan by providing a friendly, caring environment where we educate children by teaching sound eating habits, serving balanced menus, and exposing them to a wide variety of nutritious, attractive, and tasty food to support learners as they're achieving their fullest potential. The United States Department of Agriculture sets the goal of school meals to safeguard the health and well-being of, nation, of the nation's children by encouraging the domestic consumption of nutritious agricultural foods and to give children an understanding of the relationship between proper eating habits and good health. The USDA goals are the driving force behind SMSD's food service goals for 23-24. These goals were also influenced by student, parent, staff, and administrator feedback. The goals of the 23-24 food service the goals for the 23-24 food service team are on the screen, and I'll provide you a few more details about these goals. Our first goal was to educate on and increase the number of reimbursable meals. The, and a reimbursable meal is a meal containing the correct items or components as defined by USDA. When a meal is reimbursable, USDA will provide funding for the meal based on the meal benefit status of the student free, reduced, or paid. This understanding by students, parents, and even the board is very important when discussing school meals. To help educate the students on reimbursable meals and meet, meet the USDA requirement that meal information be posted at the beginning of the serving line, we developed new menu boards, which you see uh, an example of here. At the elementary school level, the menu boards use pictures of the food, um, with the item name below it to explain to the students what was on the menu and which food component the food belonged to. 
pictures were used in elementary schools because students are still learning to read. So at the middle and high school level, menu boards just use the menu, menu names to identify the foods. These new menu boards were well received by the students. Um, as I filled in as manager, I noticed the students looking at the menu boards. They were quick to tell me if I had an error on the menu boards. <laughs> um, and also, um, they informed me that the picture of the red pepper strips uh, kind of looked like bacon. So, obviously, we need to keep working on our photography skills. <laughs> um, during the KSD administrative review, the KSD consultants were very compliment compliment of the menu boards as a communication tools for the students. Another educational piece was our guide to reimbursable meals information sheet, which we made into posters and posted in all the serving areas. As far as increase the number of reimbursable meals, the 23-24 average daily participation district-wide for breakfast was 3,037 breakfasts and 14,870 lunches. When comparing this school year to the 22-23 school year, this is approximately 40 breakfasts lower, um, but we did increase by 500 lunches per day in, um, over 22-23. The highest breakfast participation day was November 15th with 3,659 breakfasts, and the highest lunch participation, October 31st with 15,629 <laughs> lunches. I'm sure you can guess why that was the case. <clears throat> the food service department is financially independent. This means that the department revenues are up are to this means the department revenues are to pay for all the expenses, which includes salaries, benefits of all food service employees, food and supplies including computer software and all hardware, the food establishment license along with any other necessary operational costs. The food service fund pays the district full indirect costs as calculated by KSD. This chart details the percentage of revenue that is spent on labor and food and supply. Textbook food service operation guidelines would encourage an operation to aim for 40% labor and 40% on food and 20% on supplies and other expenses. At SMSD, food and supplies are grouped together under one percentage. So that's why it would be over 40%. The increase in food and supply percentages is due to the continued effect of inflation. Labor costs is increasing due to the filling of vacancies. The increase in hourly wage and the hiring and retention bonus. While we see an increase in labor percentage from 21 to 22 uh, to the current year, labor cost is lower compared to other years. This is in part due to the change in staffing since we are um, since we are not using reusable trays. Using disposable compostable trays saves on labor as well as, sa as, well as saves water and electric electricity. The food service department carries a three month operating balance as allowed by USDA. This helps in the fall when purchases are made and salaries are paid before our next reimbursement from USDA is received. The current unpaid meal debt is provided on this slide here, low balance and negative balance phone calls occur daily. Monthly emails are sent to families regarding negative balances and we'll start weekly emails this week. The SMSD policy on unpaid meal debt is the result of USDA regulations that require districts to define debt, both bad and delinquent. Board policy EE meets those regulation requirements. Our second goal was to increase education on smart snacks in schools and the SMSD wellness policy. This school year, the smart snacks in schools quick guide and wellness plan document is in the process of receiving a more modern look as well as getting it translated into Spanish. The wellness committee will be reviewing the new document soon and we hope to have it posted online shortly. Another recommendation from the wellness committee was for food service to promote the differences between the foods we offer and what is available in the public. A short presentation was given to the SMAC PTA on this, and we will have more information on our website about that as well. One takeaway from the presentation was that the food being served in the schools may um, have the same brain na brand name as some that you serve at home. However, our products are different. 
So an example is Pop-Tarts. We do serve Pop-Tarts, but they are whole grain rich, which you cannot buy in the grocery store. They're specially formulated for school meals. Goal number three was to increase sustainability practices wherever possible. In support of the district's sustainability efforts, food service returned to reusable spoons and forks in the elementary schools. This was an investment of about $7,600 in purchasing reusable spoons and forks, uh, both in August and we have had to continue to buy them. Um, however, this did save approximately $58 a day because we are not buying throwaway plastic uh, spoons and forks. In secondary schools to support sustainability efforts, um, we are um, encouraging students to follow the wellness policy and bring their own reusable water bottle from home. So we discontinued our bottled water for purchase as an a la carte item. Um, we also are required by USDA regulations to make water available at mealtime via water fountains or water pitchers if they don't have a fountain. So. Our fourth, fourth goal was to improve procedures used to match students with the direct certification list. This school year, the Food Service Department found additional ways to match SMSD students with the state's direct certification list in order to capture more students who might qualify for meal benefits. One of the ways Food Service is now matching students is through the food service software, Premiero Edge. We found through that software that we can use addresses to match students. Um, once the software finds a match, we validate that match through Skyward. And then we also look in Skyward to see who their siblings might be. Um, because if one child in the household would qualify, directly certify, then the remaining students do as well in the household. Except for foster students, that does not apply. Another way food service is matching students is accessing the entire Johnson County direct certification list and looking for potential matches with enrolled students by matching name and birth date. Finally, a change was made to the direct certification notification letter asking parents to notify food service if all their children were not listed on the notification. By mid-February, the number of students directly certified had increased by 126 students as compared to last year during the same time period. Develop school meals driven by student preferences was our fifth goal, and it's always a goal. <laughs> um, we always want our meals, our, our menus to be reflected by their preference. This year, Food Service sought to increase collection of student feedback on menus and meal preferences. Now, we didn't coordinate our efforts with Dr. Sinclair and her informal survey at the beginning of every board meeting, <laughs> but we appreciate the input. <laughs> um, food Service does have multiple ways to collect menu preference data from students. First, our kitchen managers, kitchen managers collect input from students as they go through the line each day. Uh, and because I know the board likes to hear from students, here are a few comments we heard this year about our meals. French toast tastes like my mom's. And this was in reference to the French toast we're now making from scratch at the elementary level at breakfast. You cook better than my mom. Uh, that would be high compliment if somebody told me that, because my mom is a very good cook. Um, the pasta is better than any gourmet restaurant I've ever been in. And this is a reference to our new... Uh, baked penne on the elementary school level. On drumstick day in the elementary schools, a student said, this has to be mystery meat because it's too good to be a real chicken. <laughs> it is real chicken. It's a bone-in chicken leg. <laughs> so, real chicken. Um, from this verbal input, all kitchen managers were provided the opportunity to submit feedback on the current menu. Then in the spring, a focus group of kitchen managers met to discuss the menu in more detail and brainstorm new ways or new ideas for the 24-25 school year. And then last week, the managers, all managers met and we had small group discussions about the menu. Second, at the elementary level, the point of sale system is used to track which entree each student selects. In addition, all schools track the amount of food produced by item. The Food Service Department collects this data for use in revising menus, not only for the current year, but for future menus. The most popular lunch entree by school level is listed here. Um, for fun, I calculated how many French toast sticks, which is three sticks per serving, we served in the first half of the year for elementary students. 
That number is 120,855 uh, sticks uh, were served, as well as 80,570 sausage patties. It's two patties per sausage, uh, or serving, I mean. On the subject of sausage, though, our sausage is a chicken sausage patty, which is lower in calories and fat compared to a pork sausage. This is just another way school meals are different than what might be perceived um, when you see sausage on the menu. Finally, Food Service conducted student focus groups at Deemer Elementary, Marsh Elementary, East Antioch Elementary, and Hawker Grove Middle School. This student input provided some common themes, such as a request to bring back spice stations, soft tacos, popcorn shrimp, and hummus, to name a few. Currently, Food Service is doing a pilot on the spice station, which is all salt-free, to analyze the cost of this addition and is, and is in recipe development stage for hummus and other recipes as recommended by students and staff. I also have another great story from a focus group. We had a sixth grader ask us for um, salt to season, season their fries. I had to explain, unfortunately, we're not allowed to do that per, per USDA regulations. And a third grader popped up and he goes, well, why is that? And before I could answer him, he goes, Oh, hypertension and high blood pressure, right? <laughs> and I said, absolutely. And, that's, uh, and that story to me is a good uh, showcase that would make USDA proud that our students are making the connection between school meals and health. In strengthening our connection with human resource team, Food Service adopted the, the goal set by human resources. Over the course of the last few years, staffing has been a challenge, specifically finding applicants and the coverage of employee absenteeism. This school year, there has been an improvement in both areas. In 22-23 school year, there were 71 applicants who were interviewed for positions. 47 were offered positions, and 23 of those applicants are still employed today. Currently, in the 23-24 school year, 51 applicants were interviewed, 38 were offered positions, and 33 are currently employed. The pool of applicants food service receives has changed in diversity. Prior to May 2023, 20, applicants of Hispanic uh, ethnicity made up 16% of the applicant pool, but that is now 27.4%. Uh, the number of black African American applicants has fallen from 14.5 to 5.6. The current ethnicity and race percentages for the food service staff are presented on the slide. This school year, food service did participate in the retention and attendance incentive. We have seen our absentee rate um, come down 4.24% this year because of it, I would guess. Um, I also have a, another student comment to share about our staff. An elementary student told one of our employees, I know you're really, really tired a lot, but I want to thank you for working hard every day. So I thought that statement was pretty sweet and tells you why we... We do what we do every day. But beyond the data, we are a department that takes pride in what we do, work hard each day, and are rewarded with student smiles. And the 23-24 school year has been a time for food service to shine in a variety of ways, ways that don't always show in the data. From a successful KSD administrative review, various all-stars, increase in scratch-made food, using local beef, and many other small ways we improved this year that are not typically included in a, in a program evaluation. However, our team is very proud of the enhancements we've made this year, so I did want to at least do a small mention. Moving forward, we will continue to look for ways to enhance our department so that we continue to educate children by teaching sound eating habits, serving balanced menus, and exposing them to a wide variety of nutritious, attractive, and tasty food to support them as they learn. And that concludes my program evaluation. Happy to take questions. Um, Ms. Liz, thank you very much. That is uh, very thorough. It's impressive that you're taking on six goals. <laughs> it's a heavy lift. And I have to say, I'm, I think I'm gonna go with team French toast stick. I love breakfast for dinner even. Yep. So I'm gonna put myself right in that camp. But anyways, I'm gonna open up to questions. Anyone? Any follow-up questions? Okay. I, I, do, so, I do have one comment. I'm just really shocked that no one has corn on that list. No one has corn. School corn is the best. 
it, it is probably our highest serving vegetable behind potatoes, of course. Um, I, I was told by my seven-year-old that you guys cut red peppers better than I do this weekend, so I might need a little lesson. <laughs> that was a training technique that we taught them this year. <laughs> yeah. I have a, just a very quick question. I don't want to um, take too much time, but what is a walking taco? I am unfamiliar with the terminology, and I'm super curious now. <laughs> so walking taco is um, reduced fat. Doritos. So it is Doritos, the brand name, but they're reduced fat, which you can't buy in the store, unfortunately. Um, for me, I like them. I like them. Um, that we put taco meat. So we open the bag. It's a special bag that they make for, the, for this product. And you open the bag and you put the taco meat in there with cheese. And then they can add lettuce. We do have that off on the bar. So that's what a walking taco is. Thank you. Super fun. Well, I also appreciate the reference inf the, that you put at the end, the reference information for food service program. It helps to educate all of us on the board, or myself anyways. So I appreciate the reference info. Um, and also congratulations on all these non, the zero violation, the non, you know, mm -hmm. clean bill of health, I guess, yes. numbers. So thank you. Grace, real quickly, can you give us an update? Um, I know I had this question recently from two separate board members on what our current unpaid balances are as we speak, and then maybe if you could give me any donation information if you have it. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's, it's approximately about 165,000 right now, but keep in mind we carried over 55,000 of that, whereas last school year we started at zero, okay? So if you take out that 55,000, we're still behind, I, uh, I don't know how to word this exactly right, but behind by 5000 We have $5,000 less debt now than we did this year at this time, last year. Wait, ugh, sorry. No, that makes we sense. got it. <laughs> that makes sense. Until, can you explain how we get to zero? Oh, uh, we got to zero originally because of the free meals from everybody and the donations we were still getting from people. So um, we get large donations typically. Yes, uh, currently right now we have We've had about $22,000 in donations, and we have another about uh, $2,100 that we're anticipating coming in that we were told about today, but we haven't actually got the money. And then we also anticipate some senior rollover at the end of each year, correct? Yes. I mean, we do always encourage uh, definitely senior families leaving to donate those funds. Um, we also encourage inactive uh, families to donate any positive funds that they have. Um, and so we, ha we do collect some that way as well, that people that are leaving the district just tell us, uh, just donate. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yep. Appreciate it. Our next discussion item, item 3.2, is early childhood education program update. Dr. Neal, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard, Dr. Sinclair, members of the board. It's my pleasure to be here this evening to provide you an update regarding early childhood education in the Shawnee Mission School District. Uh, like food service, we're really proud to have an incredibly hardworking team, and we're excited. I'm excited to be here to share a little bit about our work um, and to share that with the community. Uh, we are fortunate in Shawnee Mission to be able to do what we call um, provide a pipeline of early learning opportunities um, for our community. And so I'll share with you a little bit about each of the programs, starting first with our Parents as Teachers program. And there's, it's hard to, to really do justice to the work that we do without um, really seeing it in action. So I've included some photos here for you um, so that you can get a sense. Our parents as teachers, this happens to be a picture of, if you'd go back just a second, Shelley, um, that is our Touch a Truck event. Uh, and it's a special collaboration with our Project Blue Eagle programs at the um, Career and Technical Center. And so the students there um, open up their space. And you can see um, they bring out a lot of opportunities. Um, our O&M partners bring out large trucks. And so the students have a chance to get up close, to climb up into a cab. Um, we have a local Teamsters group that has brought out really large trucks. And so that is just a really fun day. That's an example of one of our um, group connections and a partnership event that we do with our Parents as Teachers PTA. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But I wanted to highlight that um, photo because I think that shares an example of how we are engaged 
engaging our families in the community um, of our youngest uh, birth to three children. You go ahead. So parents as teachers, um, we utilize the parents as teachers national curriculum. And parents as teachers really, the, it's a very simple idea. Our parent educators really focus on promoting that early development, learning, and health of children by coming alongside and coaching and supporting um, parents and caregivers to really be their child's best first teacher. It is a home visiting program, so many of our families receive, receive home visits with our parent educators. And uh, you can start, you can sign up prenatally, so we begin even before the children are born, working with those families to prepare them, and then follow along with them until the children age out at age three. Our focus is trying to provide at least two full years of service for those families. And our home visits follow that national parents as teachers curriculum, and it focuses on really three elements and it's changed a little bit over the years um, to bring in family well-being as well as focusing on helping parents understand those developmental milestones and then uh, that parent-child interaction so our parent educators will bring in an activity um, sit on the floor with the families and help their parent um, the parent to feel confident about some of the things that they should be doing with their children this program is funded through a grant from the state uh, and it does have a required local match so local dollars do provide the um, rest of the funding for that. Our parents as teachers, just a few statistics. We are currently a Blue Ribbon affiliate. Um, we have been in the process of undergoing the um, QEIP, the Quality uh, Performance Review. This fortunately only happens every five years because it is a significant process uh, where our team goes through a self-study um, and it really looks at 21 um, essential requirements and like 81 quality standards that we have to provide evidence that we are meeting. So we have successfully filed that um, self-study. We also have to upload some files that the National Center will look at. And so it'll be a few months before we hear back from them the feedback um, to see how we are, are doing with our fidelity and if we will achieve that blue ribbon uh, affiliate status again moving forward. We currently have seven parent educators serving in our district. Uh, we have two vacancies for parent educators that we're actively trying to fill and we also have a vacancy for a parent education uh, supervisor position and then we also have one amazing administrative support team member who um, helps with enrollment etc. One of our parent educators is bilingual on staff, and you can see the statistics there. I put the statistics in for last year because by the end of the year, our statistics will look somewhat similar, but last year we ended up serving 581 children uh, from 450 families um, through the program. I mentioned and showed you the photo earlier of group connections. We do several of those. Last year we had 17 group connections. We had nine activities that were hosted in partnership with our PTA. We offer weekly play centers uh, and we are a 12 month program so those will continue through the summer. And we're always trying to continuously improve and look at how can we best serve families uh, and families with changing um, you know, needs. And so this year we have um, tried some evening and Saturday play centers. The Saturday play centers have been very um, popular. And so we'll continue to use that data. You can see there that um, we really appreciate the partnership of our Shawnee Mission Education Foundation. You can see Dolly there at one of our events. Um, and many of our um, families are signed up for and taking advantage of that Dolly Parton Imagination Library so building strong literacy foundations uh, from the time you know if they sign up right away they can end up with a library of 60 books by the time they turn five and that's um, that's amazing next we want to move into our pre-kindergarten or our pre-k um, program our pre-K program, our team developed um, its pre-K mission, and you can see there that it really does mirror um, the district's mission. A large part of what we do is um, we certainly provide a, a robust learning opportunity, very developmentally appropriately focused. Play-based education is a core tenet to what our team members do, but also fostering that sense of belonging, not just for our children, but for our families, because we have an opportunity to touch the families many of them for the very first time when they come into the district, and we know that that's an important responsibility for us. So our mission really mirrors the district's mission. 
an overview. So we have 31 early childhood classrooms um, in, in Shawnee Mission. That includes the uh, 12 classrooms that are located at the uh, Early Childhood uh, Education Center, but then also 19 classrooms. This year they are at 18 elementary schools, and we are so excited that next year we will actually be at 19 elementary schools. We're actually going to, we have one school where we have two classrooms. We're going to take one of those classrooms and move it to Rushton, so we're excited to have a presence there uh, for next school year. And that will give us 56% of our elementary schools with a pre-K classroom. Uh, because it, we get this question a lot, so I felt this was a great opportunity to share. Just a reminder, for, we start first by serving our four-year-old students. We want to capture as many of those as possible. So students to be eligible must be four on or before August 31st. Uh, but they also cannot be kindergarten eligible. Many families will call sometimes and ask us, but if their child is five on or before August 31st, the state considers them to be kindergarten eligible and thus they are not pre-K eligible. They uh, must, our families must uh, reside in the Shawnee Mission School District, and in order to provide as robust an offering as we can, we really do braid a variety of funding streams to do that. So we um, put together funds from that are Title I funds, our state at-risk funds, um, the Kansas Preschool Pilot, uh, which is a grant that we write annually, and then we also have some uh, tuition-based, fee-based programs, because we know some families would not meet the qualifications for our no fee, but really would like that quality um, pre-k education a reminder that our pre-k program is a half a day uh, and they attend five days a week and we have a wonderful partnership with our um, out of school time providers YMCA and Johnson County Parks and Rec who provide the wraparound care at some designated sites where we have been able to have enough enrollment to do so. And I'm excited two schools next year will be added for wraparound care Rushton and Roseland will join um, to have wraparound care at those sites in addition to the ones where we have them currently. Um, we kind of covered this, so uh, an important note here, you might have a question about the Title I funded pre-K. Not all of our Title I locations, many of our title schools are pre-K um, sites but not all of them are funded through title funds. So sometimes um, if a family doesn't meet a qualifier but they live in, a, in that title um, boundary area, we may have to find them a different location if their school is not funded as a title funded pre-K, but we have some other options. Uh, it just means sometimes they have to transport to another location. Go ahead. I might have um, been remiss in not mentioning that of those 19 sites, uh, four of them are um, unified sites, so they combine the teachers in those sites and locations, provide um, the case management for um, five special education students in addition to the 10 general education peers that join them in those classrooms. You can see here on this screen um, the variety of qualifiers uh, that a family could meet uh, to attend a no fee, so at, for, at no cost could attend our programming. Um, those are not criteria that we set as a school district that is designated by the state. And with the exception of reduced lunch, um, which is only specific to our um, Kansas Preschool Pilot um, assurances, most of them are very similar across those at-risk sites and the KPP funded sites. Our tuition option, we are staying with the $3,400 this year as our tuition. It will remain the same as it was this current year for next year. And we offer the uh, families an opportunity to pay that in 10 installments of $340. Um, we believe that's highly competitive, and our families um, share with us that that is a really, um, they appreciate that they get amazing quality education for that rate, and we're happy to be able to provide that. Early Childhood Center, thanks to the community, um, the board, and the bond um, over two summers. We did have to pack up, but it was worth it. The renovations there uh, have been just tremendous. If you walk in that space, it is light, it is bright, it is colorful, and it is right-sized for our early learners. That was a space that was originally a junior high school, and so now it is um, sized uh, and has a real feel um, of zest for our early learners, and we're grateful for that. The hallways even are just remarkable. The removal of some of those old lockers, widening, the lighting changes, have just been a dramatic positive impact in that space. 
I thought it was interesting. We're really digging into the data around um, the families that we're serving. And you can see here that we have some differences in terms of our, our demographic percentages. Um, this happens to be a race and ethnicity across our parents as teachers, our pre-K, and our kindergarten numbers. So our parents as teachers, we had a really um, great discussion as a team, and we want to utilize this data and this information to help us know where do we need to go? How do we need to market and connect with partners better? Because you can see here that we are not serving um, as diverse a population through our Parents as Teachers program. It's not quite reflective of our district as a whole. Our pre-K program, on the other hand, is slightly more diverse. But um, when we talked about and you looked at some of those qualifiers, um, you know, that's likely by design because many of the students do come to us um, through, uh, you know, like English language learning if they qualify that way. So sometimes those, um, I think, boost our, um, our diversity there in our pre-K. And then kindergarten is somewhat reflective, a little bit more district-wide. So I thought that was kind of just a helpful um, graphic to see who we're serving. We also, um, with the Parents as Teachers program, we delved into to where are they coming from across the five high school feeder sites. And that was really interesting. We found that two of our high school feeder sites are outliers where we're serving uh, fewer students. And so we're gonna try to dig in to see how, why, is, why are those areas not as robust um, as some of our others. So um, we'll be doing that work in the coming year. Okay, go on ahead. So just like um, our K-12 uh, friends, we are working on our WIGs. Um, we're working on helping families understand the importance of students attending. So attendance has been one of our goals, and our teachers have been working really hard to help parents understand, even at pre-K, why it's so important for your child to be at school. And with the exception of a very small number, um, we, are, we are seeing some, some great improvement in our attendance district-wide in those pre-K classrooms. And then we're also taking a look at some literacy and numeracy measures. So our, our lag measure is uh, measured through our MyIGDs, which is our summative um, testing. And then our lead measures, we're measuring monthly some specific things around rhyming, um, letter sound um, identification, and one-to-one -one correspondence. If you want to advance. You can see here, this is the literacy component of the MyIGDs um, assessment. And every year we do um, move students forward. So you can see here where the green has grown from the fall to the spring. We just give those twice a year. But what we noticed when we've been looking at kind of over a four year period, that while we grow them each time, that growth has, is really staying kind of flat. So that's something that we're still working on. How can we continue? What do we need to do to continue to push some of that growth forward? And that's something that we'll continue to work on. These numbers, again, are relatively flat with the exception of one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence and the numeracy. Um, this year, that number did, um, did shift a little bit. Go ahead. And that brings us to Jump Start to Learning. That's our summer program for incoming kindergarten students. Um, high um, engagement with families and students um, around some foundational skills, but really the, the benefit of this program is really around those social, uh, emotional school routines, helping introduce students to what they will be seeing um, when they step into kindergarten. If you'll go ahead. Uh, we typically have two sections per site, and we try to keep those numbers at 10 children to e each teacher. Um, so again, it's a half a day program and a really small student-teacher ratio so that the students can really get a sense of it's great for students that maybe haven't had a lot of formal education opportunities. Also, students who maybe have a little bit of anxiety, it's great for them to be able to step in with grace to the smaller um, community feel and to really get down those expectations and procedures so that then they can be leaders when kindergarten begins uh, in August. We, um, those are the numbers where you can see um, that we last summer served about 233 students. This summer we're planning to serve 16 schools at 15 sites. Uh, so we hope that that number will continue to increase again as we've kind of bounced back after the pandemic. 
It's traditionally been funded through Title I funds and other grants. Um, last year and this year, it will actually be funded through ESSER uh, dollars. And last year, it was um, supplemented by a grant through the Shawnee Mission Education Foundation from the Hall Family Foundation. We are grateful for their continued support. And um, the curriculum each year, we revise and look at that um, as we adopt new curriculum. We have some teachers that are just devoted to this program, and so they will come alongside and take a look at what changes do we need to make to ensure that program is um, really doing um, all that it can for those incoming students. We continue with our, we give a pretest kind of at the beginning, and then we give that test again, and you can see we continue to make great gains, even in a three-week time frame uh, across literacy and numeracy, but also on the next slide, those behaviors, those classroom behaviors and routines, that's what we hear by and large um, from our, our team members that that really makes the biggest impact. And there's a little bit from our parents. Um, we hope again this year to be able to do a field trip for the program. So every child will get a chance to ride a school bus and come to a puppet show. We invite and open the doors to parents and siblings. We don't want that to be a barrier. And that's typically just such an amazing day. The program actually will be featured. It's featured in the 2023 annual report through the Hall Family Foundation. We're really um, proud and pleased to be featured in that. And there will be a reception honoring the featured programs in their uh, storied impact report at the end of this month. Excited to take one of our um, Jumpstart teachers from East Antioch um, with us to be recognized at that event. And Jumpstart 2024, we're looking forward to that. We've um, uh, been interviewing um, and finding our administrative interns with the kindergarten welcomes that are coming up that have been the last couple of weeks. We're uh, accepting those applications and um, we are again going to be offering that at 15 locations. Information can be found on the website or at their local elementary school and we'll have it from July 8th to the 26th this year. And that is it. I stand for any questions you may have. Um, thank you. Well, if, did you? Yeah, Mr. Westbrook. Uh, wonderful report. Thank you very much for that. I I heard reference earlier in your presentation to parent educators. Um, are those people that we employ? Do I, yes, we and, employ and, them. And, and these are folks who help parents be better parents. Is that? Give me a give me a picture of the job description of a parent educator. Sure. So our parent educators, literally, when I talk to families um, about this program, it is a free program that you can sign up for, where a parent educator who is trained. Um, there are many of them um, they either are trained as educators, they might be trained as social workers, but all of them go through and are certified through the National Parents as Teachers um, Center to be uh, certified parent educators. And they come into the home and sit with the families. Um, they take them through as their children age through very specific progressions where the parent, so the parent can support their child's development. They also do ongoing screenings and they listen to parents. They provide them and connect them with resources. So we often will connect um, if we are seeing some concerns or a parent's voicing some concerns with um, infant toddler of Johnson County. They're great partners and so we can provide those screenings and get them connected for early intervention. Uh, if they need um, other resource connections, maybe they're struggling uh, with, with food or they might be struggling with um, utilities. The parent educator is there in the home. They develop a really trusting relationship and they can help connect them with those necessary resources. That's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had just one question. Thank you so much, Leanne, for being here. Ms. Borgman and I were just saying that we think it should go through age like 18 or 21. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to come back when our parents educate? Please come back. Um, my question was just about the long-term funding source. I'm really kind of careful about anything that was ESSER funding and making sure that we have a plan for the long-term funding. So I'm curious for Jumpstart what we're thinking about long-term on funding. Sure. We've already um, identified that that needs to go back to being a title-funded program. Um, it was helpful for us to be able to shift that to the ESSER funding um, during that time where we had some challenges um, with title funding. And so we knew that it was really important to keep the program going. And so this allowed us to do that um, because they were federal dollars. But we Yes, we have been very loud and clear about the, the need to be able to return that to um, title funds. Great. Thank you. 
right. Um, yeah, I think all my questions have been answered um, as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate this. I appreciate the, the digging into the data as well as um, sharing some of the parent voices and whatnot. Um, I, did, um, I did remember my one other question. Do you see some um, families or like uh, some of our three-year-olds, some of our um, students being able to come third and fourth grade or having some siblings coming through some of the um, variety of early childhood opportunities? Is that anything that's? Are we? I, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, I'm just thinking about the opportunity for kids to take advantage, of, for some of our young families, young children to take advantage of the early childhood opportunities more than one year. Yes. Like, so multiple summers, like as a third grader or a fourth grader. I mean, a three-year-old or four-year-old, or a four-year-old and then jump start. Is yes. That we do, and so um, I mentioned that we first focus on making sure we can capture as many four-year-olds mm -hmm. as possible in pre-K, but we keep we really look closely at those numbers, and end of July, 1st of August, if we are seeing classrooms where we have openings um, and we have enough openings where we are like, I don't know that we would fill all of those by the start of school. The state now does fund through the at-risk funding, does allow us to serve three-year-olds, and so we will plug in three-year-olds into those pre-K classrooms when we can. Um, we know that there's a, a large gap at three, and so you know our goal ultimately, and I think if you talk to our teachers who have had the chance to have three-year-olds and they continue, um, that is, that's a wonderful opportunity, so we hope that we can continue, that that funding mechanism will continue to grow, and that our facilities and our plans in the future may offer us an opportunity to serve a greater number of those students. It is nice with our parents as teachers, that pipeline, our parent educators, when they get ready to exit the children at three, those families can stay engaged through some of the group connections through the PTA, but they can also give them some early transition planning around, make sure you look for, at this time, when the district will open up enrollment, et cetera, so they can set them up for that success. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you for your report. Dr. Hubbard? Did you Thank you, that? Dr. Neal. I would just also add that our most recent podcast, as I mentioned in the superintendent report, is on all of these programs. And so if you want to hear more, or we had a pre-K teacher from Brookridge join us and just talk about some experiences happening in pre-K, so it was kind of fun, and there's great visuals there as well. So. Thank you. Um, our last um, discussion item is item 3.3, budget workshop non-operating funds. So yeah, I would like to ask um, Russell Knapp to join us for our first of many workshops coming forward. Just, just two. <laughs> well, by the time you add August, the hearing, and yes. it's more than it's two. good stuff. Am I on? You're All on. Right. Well, good evening. Thank you. Um, during the budget development process, the district's financial resources are allocated to support the, the district's strategic plan. When presenting the district's budget, expenditures are often referred to as operational and non-operational. Operational funds include the daily expenditure associated with running the school district, such as salaries and benefits, utility, student transportation, etc. Non-operating funds are primarily spent to maintain and repair facilities and to purchase equipment and software. Capital outlay funds cannot be used for the daily operation of uh, uh, operational expenditures. You've seen this slide a couple times in the last few years. The district's total budget is $485 million, which is made up of 37 separate funds that we categorize into these five groups. The, group, the three groups of funds that I'll cover tonight are the capital outlay and bond funds, flow-through funds, and the self-supported funds. Each of these group of funds are restricted for a specific purpose by state statutes, and I will I'll expand on each individual fund as I go through my presentation. The budget developmental process begins in November by schools and departments assessing student and building needs and incorporating those needs into their budget request for the future year. You can find each building's profile and needs assessments 
posted on the district website under Information Central. Revenue estimates are made in December and tweaked if any funding changes are enacted by the spring legislative session. And as Mrs. Owsley mentioned earlier tonight, the, uh, the regular session adjourned without approving a K through 12 budget. Uh, so that work will have to be completed uh, when they return during the veto session on April 29th. Uh, hopefully we'll get positive results of that and we'll work that into our May 13th budget workshop. In January, the HR team reviews building needs assessments and any of their future staffing needs with the elementary and secondary principals. Cabinet reviews these preliminary budgets and provides the budget team with any adjustments. Personnel changes are then incorporated into the budget and other major budget line items are finalized. The recommended budget is presented to the board at board meetings in April and May, and lastly, the board adopts the budget in August. Many of the funds presented tonight are supported by local taxes, which are directly impacted by the district's assessed valuation. As the bar graph shows, for the next year, the assessed valuation is, is projected to increase 5% to $5.77 billion. The county will provide us another estimate in June, which is what we'll use to finalize our state budget documents. The county finalizes the assessed valuation in October. So we work off an estimate in June, and then they finalize it in October. The district has a very large footprint with 59 sites and $1.8 billion in insured property that must be maintained on a daily basis. Doing so takes significant resources. Strategy plan, I'm sorry, strategic plan, strategy five states, we will strategically focus resources to, to support state-of-the-art facilities to accomplish beliefs, missions, and objectives. We accomplish this with the financial resources from the capital outlay funds and the bond funds. The capital outlay fund revenue are generated from an eight mil local tax levy. The revenue is estimated to be 45 point million next year. In addition, the district anticipates receiving 2.65 million from the sale of the old Westwood View Elementary School. We are projecting a beginning balance of 22.3 million, which would leave us a total of $70 million available uh, to cover operations for our capital outlay uh, project. The anticipated capital outlay budget for 24-25 fiscal year is $65.4 million. As part of the budget development process, the schools and department assess their furniture and equipment needs which totaled $2.2 million. Technology budgets, $4. million for technology equipment, infrastructure needs, and software. Operation and maintenance budgets, $13.5 million, is for daily operating costs, large cycle projects for the 59 facilities, and any unforeseen projects. Apple lease makes up $7 million of our annual uh, capital outlay budget. In addition, $10 million goes to pay for salaries and benefits of operation, I'm sorry, of maintenance and custodial personnel. This includes the four and a half million of custodial salary and benefits that provided the financial resources to fund strategy three, where secondary teachers teach five out of seven periods. After budgeting, budgeting for anticipated needs, this leaves an unallocated budget of 28.7 million. This money would be used to support bond projects and any unforeseen emergencies that would arise during the fiscal year. We budget a minimum ending fund balance of $5 million to cover the cash flow that it takes to get through the project, paying those projects off from the beginning of July until our next large tax payment, which comes in, would come in January of 2025. The other group of funds that goes to our capital needs are the bond funds. The other, um, our facilities, I'm sorry, the district is very fortunate to have a community that has been very supportive of our bond referendum as the voters approved in January 21, the authorization to sell $264.22 million in bonds. Issue what we split the, we split that amount in two and did an issuance one and two. 
issuant one uh, with the premium and the interest earned from investing in CDs totaled $147.2 million, and that has been fully spent. So now we are working on uh, spending down issuance two, and we have, uh, as of through March 24, we have spent 114 million of approximately $146 million available uh, for bond funds. When a district sells bonds, that creates debt, which must be paid off in the form of principal and interest payments. This is very similar to a home mortgage. The district's 24-25 scheduled debt payment is $37.7 million, and the financial resources are provided by a local tax revenue from a bond and interest tax levy. In addition, the district has a special assessment local tax that goes to in the paying of the Johnson County wastewater and any construction work performed in easement areas on our district property. This chart shows the debt schedule through 2044. Uh, the different colors represent each bond issuance with the interest shown in red. This fund's mill levy is directly impacted by any increase in our assessed valuation. Uh, with the 5% increase in assessed valuation, we anticipate uh, the, the bond and debt, the bond and interest tax levy to, to remain flat at 7.434. The next group of funds is the flow through funds to the state. Cost of living is an additional weighting in the school finance formula for areas of Kansas that significantly exceed the average home price in Kansas. Funding is received in general state aid, but is levied locally through taxes. The revenue is remitted to the state and then refunded back to the district through the weighted formula. The district's uh, cost of living factor is 6.39% for 24-25. The cap is currently 7%, um, but legislation that was passed last year based that cap now on the cost of living um, index. So that amount will go up, that 7% amount will go up whatever that uh, cost of, average cost of living index is uh, yet to be determined by KSD. Uh, the other flow through fund is CAPERS, which is the state retirement system. We get four quarterly payments to the district from the state that is immediately withdrawn and returned to the state. So these funds must be budgeted as an expenditure, but do not remain, but, all, but remain in our bank account for about one day. The last group of funds that the cover is the uh, self-supported funds. They are deemed self-supported because the revenue raised is enough to cover the budget expenditures without receiving transfers from the operating funds. One exception is the Instructional Research Resources Fund, which I'll cover on my next slide. The one other fund to note is the Food Service Fund, which accounts for our student meal programs that you just heard about from Grace tonight. As we have mentioned in previous board meetings, the delivery model for instructional resource materials have evolved from purchasing a physical textbook to an online subscription that provides access to the material for a certain term, requiring more frequent and expensive renewals. We also mentioned the current revenue stream was not enough to fund the long-term cost for our instructional resource to refresh plan. To help offset that cost, two years ago, we reestablished the elementary instructional resource fee of $60. In addition, we had to support this fund with transfers from the operating funds. As you can see by the blue bars, our projected expenditure of $25.7 million over the next six years will exceed our projected revenues of $16.3 million, almost by $9.4 million. To balance this fund, the excess cost will be taken from the fund balance with the projected ending balance in 29.30 of $1.6 million. Preliminary estimates indicate that the total mill levy increase will be 0.62%, approximately $7 on, on an annual increase of a $200,000 value house. Final mill levies are determined in October by uh, Johnson County. Um, regarding the general fund statewide 20 mill levy, pending legislation would decrease the 20 
mill levies to 19.5. And also the state exempt on residential property valuation is currently at 40,000 and they would increase that to 100,000. Uh, that, that is part of the tax bill that has passed both the House and Senate and is waiting for the governor's approval. And then our budget timeline. Tonight's presentation starts the timeline for the formal approval process. As a reminder, the budget workshop for operating funds will be at the May 13th board meeting. Um, and I would like to thank our budget manager, Allison Starosky, who puts all this together for us and keeps uh, works on this on a daily basis, and she does a great job. That concludes my presentation. I'll uh, answer any questions you might have. All right. Thank you for that very thorough report, and you are um, very adept at explaining very complicated things in a way that we can all understand, so I appreciate the thought and effort that goes into doing that. Thank you. Um, questions, Ms. Borgman. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. I appreciate the report. Um, obviously, when it comes to finances, it's very important that we are transparent with every dollar and cent and how it's allocated. And um, could you just remind the public where they can find um, kind of our budget and what, what that looks yeah. like? Our landing page is the budget and finance. And you can find it on, on the district website under the uh, um, we we'll go to our home page and then navigate to budget and finance. Sorry. It's under about. Yep. Under about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Westbrook. Uh, I agree. This is a very thorough report. And you do, uh, you, if you could just make my own checking account as simple as you make this whole budget, <laughs> it's really terrific. Um, I have a question about our banking relationships. This was not part of your presentation tonight, mm -hmm. but I know we put that money in various um, institutions that hold that money for us in deposit relationships. Do we have an arrangement with the Johnson County banks or the Kansas banks where we distribute that money in some sort of a formula that doesn't favor one versus another and so forth? Uh, we do a request for proposal uh, typically every six years. Uh, to local banks. Uh, UMB currently has uh, that business, and so they, they bid based on uh, their services, the fees that they would uh, charge to hold our money and to process all our transactions. Um, so we, um, again, yeah, UMB does that. And then for our investments, we're very restricted on what we can invest right. by state statute, and we take out, we do bids from all the local banks in Johnson County uh, typically CDs right now. So the uh, financial institutions in the area get a chance on uh, periodically every five or six years to bid for our business, and we evaluate that based on service from the current provider and the bids that come in from others, I take it? That is correct. All right, thank you. Uh, I had to, um, wanted to go back to the instructional resource fund on the, um, just looking at that chart. The so the plan really is to um, a, to prepare for those future expenditures that exceed the the money that we might charge in fees. So to try to keep the fees as low as possible for our families, that would be banked in our in our reserve funds so that we can build a little bit to be able to meet those needs over time. Is that? Well, we're, we're, we transfer that money to the instructional resource fund. So that's where that, you see where that, the line graph, um, the line bar, the, whatever that's called. The, it, the, we, we built it the last couple years um, in the pandemic when we had some. Um, so we built up some. Additional funds. available money. We were able to transfer that to build that, knowing that we were going to have to pay for this refresh cycle over the next uh, five to six years. Okay, and so that reserve starts going back down. It's, yep. So we'll need to make a new plan. Yep. At so around you'll need to keep 20, 29, 30. I would, I would <laughs> suggest not even that long. I think that's something that you're going to have to continue to budget annually to keep that account rolling. Or you're going to find yourselves with lots of instructional resources coming due and no money to do that. Okay. And so the blue bar there would look like I mean, do we anticipate, is there a, a pattern? I'm not really identifying a pattern in the, from 20 to 
you know, 2030. So we have in terms of the blue bar and expenditures, is that? We have an instructional resource fund, or excuse me, an instructional resource cycle, if you will, just like we cycle other things. We have a technology cycle. We have, okay. So we have an instructional resource cycle, and so it just kind of depends on, it might be K-6 math this year, or it might be Cornerstone Cadre this year, or um, it might be 712 ELA the following year, but we have that built out in a five, mostly five years. Sometimes we'll go as far as seven, depending on um, when softwares expire. So it's at least three million on average a year, something like that. It ebbs and flows. Some okay. it, it, an ELA um, purchase is going to be the most expensive of anything. So if it's a year where you're doing K six ELA or seven twelve ELA, it's going to be much higher than six million dollars. I'm sorry, than three million dollars. It might be closer to five or six. But then other years, it's not going to be that much, just based on the cycle. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the um, planning so far in advance and keeping us even keel in our budgeting cycle. I might All add, right. too, that things will come up in the middle of this if you have um, state standard changes at KSDE level, if you have statute requirements that change as a result of the um, legislation that we may have to purchase additional resources for. All right. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you so much for that. All right. Now we're at consent. So item 4.1, we have about 24 uh, items in, uh, um, in our consent general and then a number of bond items. So could I seek a motion from 4.1 to 6.3, unless there's a call to move anyone out? I wanted to move. Is the printing bid in that group? The, pr the printing is an action item. Action, okay. So Thank I'll get you. there Sorry. shortly. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Okay. I'm fine. Okay. So moved, Ashley. All right. Second. Second, Second point, Nerona. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Is it appropriate for me to ask a, or just make a comment on one of the items at this point? Um, I was just thankful to see that the activity fees were reduced for students next year. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, we are on action items, 7.1. So we have 12 action items. All right, so our first, 7.1, approval of character strong tier two and tier three. Dr. Hubbard. So if you'll recall, at a, our previous meeting, we adopted Character Strong as a pre-K-12 um, instructional resource, since we were just speaking of that. We failed to include the purchase of Tier 2 and Tier 3 items for this instructional resource. These items were piloted as part of the original pilot, and I'm recommending that we add um, the purchase of Tier 2 and 3 instructional resources to support the Cornerstone standards. If you have any questions, we do have some team members that were on that team here available. Um, but I felt like they did such a thorough job at providing the update last time that we didn't need them to do a presentation again. I'll move approval, Hembry. Thank you. Second? Second, Second. Borgman. All right. Any questions? Thanks. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, thank you. Item 7.2, District Technology Core Instructional Refresh. So this is a Technology Core Infrastructure Refresh. It has a really large um, budget line item on there, but this is similar to any other refresh that we would do, whether it be our, um, you know, we have an Apple refresh. We just talked about instructional resource uh, refresh. This is actually a core infrastructure refresh. So uh, we are recommending the purchase of these access points, firewall security modules, and renewal of the wireless uh, enterprise agreement and the security enterprise agreement from CDWG. This request to purchase core components of the district's technology infrastructure totals 4.5 million and some change and comes from capital outlay funds. And I have Drew Lane and Bill Shaver here. Should you have more specific questions, I should not be the one to answer this. <laughs> All right, I seek a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second, Second Henry. Henry. Oh. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. All right. Does anybody have any questions? 
All right. Thank you, Mr. Lane, for keeping us running. Um, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. All right. Item 7.4 authorization to contract with Summer One. Actually, 7.03. I'm sorry. You're just eager to I'm tonight. trying to get, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Sorry. 7.3 approval of renewal of Power School Business Plus. So, renewal of Power School Business Plus. ERP system license and subscription fee. The renewal is for three years um, from April 1st, 2023 to June 30th of 2027 at an annual increase of about 6%. <clears throat> this is for the finance and HR payroll ERP operating systems. And the estimated cost over a three-year period is 318000 and will be paid from capital outlay. All right. Motion to approve. So moved, Owsley. Second. Second, Boyd and Arona. Right. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. All right. 7.4 authorization to contract with Summer One for Print Fleet. So, Summer One, here is the, I think the item, Mr. Westbrook, that you were referring to. Uh, we did a RFQ, RFQ um, on our printing services, and um, Sumner One has won that bid. It's contracting for a 60-month term and provide equipment and services for the district's print fleet and print shop. Annual costs are estimated to be approximately $191,000, uh, almost $4.5 million for the five years, although final costs are contingent upon actual print volumes along with the needed equipment and service levels. This item is budgeted to be paid with general operating funds. This is a big change for us. We have been with RICO printing for... 20 years, and so this would mean this summer all of our equipment would be um, throughout the entire district uh, removed, RICO equipment um, removed, and Sumner One equipment moved in, so. All right, so we'll seek a motion and second, and then we can entertain discussion. So moved, Owsley. Thank you, second. Second, All right, any discussion? Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions. We, okay. What kind of experience does this recommended uh, vendor have? What kind of, what kind of, when I say experience, how many years they've been in business? Sumner One. Sumner One. Drew Lane's coming to the podium. Uh, good evening. So Sumner One has been in business for a number of years. Um, I can't tell you exactly how many years, uh, but it has been it has been quite some time. They have quite a bit of experience with other school districts, uh, Lawrence, Independence, I believe, were the references we called, and they are uh, essentially right smack dab in the middle of the Shawnee Mission School District geographically. So mm -hmm. they have considerable experience. They've been around for quite a while. I'm going to say, I believe they were in business in my previous superintendency, so that would be over 10 years. At least, I, that's minimum. I just yeah. can't speak past that. And I don't have any uh, thing up my sleeve on this, these questions. I just know that this is a big deal uh, internally. It, it'll, it'll be uh, an adjustment because we'll have new vendors, new people. Uh, I say new vendor, new people. Maybe some new processes. So um, I, I just um, I favor the prudent use of our dollars, and I think it's important to keep our vendors accountable to help them know that they should never take our business for granted and others will come and make propositions to us that are more appealing. Um, but this is a big thing. So I know you know that. I just want the board to acknowledge that this is not a, a simple task of just putting some new equipment in and taking the old equipment out. It's, um, it's going to be a big change. And I, I'm sure we'll pull it off smoothly. Uh, but I, I actually would like to commend the administration for having the courage to go ahead and be aggressive about this and take a look at this this way, because this is the way we sometimes have to improve. But um, anyway, it's a, I just want to acknowledge this is not a, just a simple little matter. So thank you for your courage and for your recommendation. I would also add um, the courier system of moving the um, large print jobs is a save in money for us. Dr. Gilhouse, can you speak more specifically to that? Uh, we have had challenges um, over the past three years due to manpower and our operations and maintenance with getting out mail every single day with our couriers. So we have cut back to three times a week 
um, and two times a week at some of the elementary schools. One of the things that this company offers is they're gonna set up their own separate complete print shop and that will be in a centralized location in our district. So we're gonna utilize their couriers, which will give us back more manpower within our district mm -hmm. to see if we can get um, more effective, more efficient uh, deliveries that would help our teachers, help our office staff, and help our administrators on a daily basis. So right now, if I order, especially at an elementary school, a print job, it may be several days before I get it, and this should help significantly improve that. That's great. All right. So if there's no more discussion, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. We are on item 7.5, authorization to renew ClassLink software subscription. So this is um, ClassLink software subscription for three years to include school years 24, 25, 25, 26, and 26, 27. And um, then actually the next three items, five, 7, 5, 7, 6, and 7, 7 are all three three-year renewals of um, softwares that we started during COVID and um, we'll be um, really monopolizing, that's not a good word, but really utilizing those ESSER three dollars to ensure that we have three more years of this and then at that point they would likely move to Capital Outlay. So this class link is the first one for a total of $264,756. Okay, and was there a savings figure in kind of moving ahead with this three year, or is that not something? In, in ClassLink there was, in IXL there was, in Canvas there is not, but mostly because we have to expend the funds, and we had them. Okay, all right, so let's start with um, ClassLink. So I need a motion to approve item 7.5. So moved, Owsley. All right, second. Second, Garcia. Okay, any discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. All right, 7.6, authorization to renew IXL. David, correct me. It was Canvas that didn't have the right. I'm pretty sure that's. Yeah, that's correct. Russ? Can okay. Yeah, Canvas does not offer. <laughs> Uh, any discount. You pay what you pay, whether you pay <laughs> one or ten. Okay. The next one is to renew IXL Learning Platform um, K through 8. It's a three-year subscription, again, paid with SR3 funds. I will mention that we currently are, have a K-12 subscription that um, came forth as part of our ESSER plan. However, uh, we, we are not seeing the utilization at the high school level that we think we should be seeing for the amount of money that we are spending. So we're reducing that to a K-8 three-year subscription. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve? So I move to Ashley. Second. Second, so. Boyd Narona. All right. Any discussion? I just have a quick, um, just so we're clear, there is a slight benefit to purchasing the three years together, but really it's we're using the ESSER dollars so as to not utilize the capital outlay for That's correct. Years. And because so. they're... They qualify right. under, yes. They qualify under ESSERs. This allows us to use those one-time dollars before they go away to set ourselves up for a couple of years moving forward as opposed to... That's correct. And it, yeah. it wouldn't be unusual that we would do a three-year anyway, yeah. but yes, the fact that we can use the ESSER 3 makes it that yeah. much more appealing. I just wasn't sure if that was clear to anyone potentially okay. watching at home. I don't know who does that, but it's possible. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, any other discussion? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. All right, so the last of these three software um, purchases authorization, authoriz authorization to renew Canvas software, item 7.7. .7. So, again, the third one being Canvas, our learning management system, um, a three year subscription, and again, SR3 funds. All right, motion to approve. So moved, Garcia. Second. Second, Owsley. All right, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, so our last um, contract, uh, 7.8, single vendor record keeper amendment. So this I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Schumacher and Jack Keller from CBiz, but just real quickly before I do that, um, Mr. Westbrook, Sumner One has been in business since 1955. 
slightly more, slightly more than 10 years. Yeah, I was off. I just knew they were in business then. I didn't know about previous, but I knew they were in business then. All right. All right, Dr. Schumacher. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hubbard. Uh, tonight we have with us Jack Keller uh, from CBiz to share an update related to our district's move to a single vendor or record keeper for our district's 403B and 457 retirement plans. If you recall, we came to you in November, November 13th, and received approval to move to Corbridge to serve as our single vendor. Uh, since that time, um, uh, this recommendation came to you at that time uh, through the district's uh, benefits committee, a recommendation from them. Uh, since that time, CBiz uh, and their team has notified us of a transition issue with one of the legacy vendors. Uh, Jack's going to provide a lot more details related to that. But the recommendation that we're bringing you tonight, again, is with a unanimous uh, vote or decision from the Benefits Committee to move in this direction. Uh, Russell and I will, will stand by to answer questions. But with that, I'll throw it to Jack. Thank you, Dr. Schumacher, and thank you, Board, for allowing me to be here tonight. Um, a, few, a few pages in here just about the benefits of consolidating uh, these retirement plan vendors. And really, you know, we were just looking to do what was in the best interest of the participants of the plan. Uh, it was an opportunity to um, decrease the fees significantly, uh, offer best-in-class investments, and most importantly, financial wellness-type education. Um, you know, to the to the plan participants, again, thorough RFP process that we went through to, to seven different record keepers, and you know, Corbridge was selected for a number of factors, uh, price being one of them, um, dedicated uh, advisors and resources, boots on the ground here to to faculty and staff within SMSD, um, but we knew as a part of this transition. Um, that there were, it, we didn't want to negatively impact any participants of the plan. So anyone who had um, an individual contract with a legacy provider, anyone who had an annuity type of a benefit, those types of retirement savings would stay behind. But moving forward, you know, this would be, you know, CBiz, we're an independent fiduciary. We're, we have a real legal responsibility to do what's in the best interest uh, of the participants. And what we uncovered was there was an arrangement between uh, Lincoln, uh, in regards specifically to their stable value fund uh, in the district, to where uh, if Lincoln was eliminated as a vendor, um, really the, the participants or, or the $5 million in that fund would be subject to immediately, they would drop to a minimum crediting rate, and the participants within that fund couldn't access these funds for, you know, five to six years. They would get installment payments. Uh, at a minimum crediting rate, and this was really going to negatively impact these participants, which is what we didn't want to have happen. So we put the project on hold, um, evaluated a, a number of different options to move forward, um, and 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 really, I think these were you know some of the options that that we did look at. But um, it was it was um, the decision from the benefits committee um, to move forward with what's called. Um, sort of a buyout of the obligation to Lincoln. So if you recall, Corbridge was the selected provider. For us to get out of this Lincoln obligation, Lincoln was asking for $421,000 for these, for these participants to get out of this investment, to move forward with Corbridge as we had all hoped to do. Um, so Corbridge is going to front that $421,000 on behalf of the district. And so as a result, uh, the Corbridge agreed upon um, fee goes up just just a little bit. We we talked about it before. Uh, the numbers are in here. Um, their record keeping fee going forward was six basis points or 0.06 percent, so one sixteenth of one percent for everything that they provide. Um, and for for us to use this Corbridge offering. Um, that would increase the fee by 12 basis points, so 0.12% for seven years. All of the participants of the plan pay that. Um, what, we, what we set out to do at the outset of this project, to decrease fees across all the, all the vendors, that still happens. So every participant will have a lower cost associated with these plans, which puts more money into the retirement savings accounts. And most importantly, it's still under the benchmark for plans this size. Even though we have this decrease, we, we came across 
the most competitive fee arrangement most of us had ever really seen. Uh, so we're still under that. We're still doing what's in the best interest of the plan participants. Uh, but again, a slight amendment to um, the numbers that we had presented. So in the act of transparency, we wanted to come back out here after that seven years is up. Um, the fee arrangement goes back down to six basis points, uh, as, as we had talked about. So um, I, think that's, I think that's really all that I wanted to hit there, Dr. Schumacher, if I look at my notes. Um, but are, are there any questions? from the board? Okay. Um, can you explain, so the fees then are paid by the participants, not by the district? That is correct, yes. And, and so the Insurance Benefits Committee reviewed the seven-year recovery plan and landed in the middle there on the seven-year recovery plan, but um, but it is this is something that is being paid for by the participants. That, that's right, and we did look at all these different recovery options, shorter time period, a little bigger number, and thought that seven-year was, was kind of the right mix of both. Okay, thank you. Can you just remind Robert or, um, who, who are the members of the Benefits Committee? Just remind us for that. Really kind of hash through the challenges of this quagmire. Yep. yep. Um, it's a representative group of all of our different employee groups. And so there's classified representation, certified, nominated by the uh, association <coughs> administrators. Um, Russell and I are on the team as non-voting members. We kind of facilitate the, the group, but a representative group of all of our employee groups. I, I was going to ask, thank you for being here, and thank you for working through this for the district. It seems really complicated. Um, I know that we ended up in November when you guys originally brought this, there were two finalists, and they were Lincoln and Corbridge. Are the rates we're getting here still better than what Lincoln was able to offer us back in October. I just want to make sure we wouldn't have had something better by just sort of scrapping Corbridge and going with Lincoln or something else that had been as a possibility earlier on. Yeah, I mean, we, um, we evaluated that, and one of the options that we put forward to the committee was starting this whole project over again and soliciting a new proposal. Um, but with the facts that were uncovered, specifically with this fund, um, the, the original proposal from Lincoln was higher than six, but lower than kind of the, the 18 where we're at right now. Um, but it would have really changed their proposal quite significantly. And we asked through the process, Lincoln, forgiveness of this obligation, would they be willing? We, we evaluated them as a single provider. So, so certainly you know, we did examine proposed costs and, and do believe that Corbridge um, is the most competitive for this plan moving forward. Anybody else? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 7 0. Thank you for being here. Oh, Thank, 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 Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. We have three policy second reads, um, uh, three board policies. Um, so let's begin with 7.9, Revised Board Policy, JGFGBA. So again, JGFGBA. <laughs> this is the longest <laughs> board policy, I think, Still. ever. <laughs> this is a final read. KASB made minor revision, revisions to this policy in the December updates. Beyond those minor revisions, additional revisions to our policy are being recommended to bring it in line with KASB model policy language. Um, the second read version slightly modifies the definition of medication to ensure that it reflects the statutory definition. This policy is only applicable to medications for the treatment of anaphylactic or asthma. The second read version also references the specific healthcare provider form that our nurses use and provide to families and then clarifies exactly what information needs to be in the form according to the uh, um, statute KSA 72-6282. Uh, 
Rachel did work um, very closely with Paula Bundy to ensure this policy reflects practice and is in line with the Kansas state statute. All right, so this is the student self-administration of medications, second read. Do I have a motion to approve? I do. Oh, so I just do want to remind that it did go through policy review committee. I should have said that. Thank you. Okay. Move approval, S Borkman. Thank you. Second, Second Hembry. All right. Discussion? I just wanted to add something really quick. Yep. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> at the KSB um, meeting this past weekend, it was really nice to get to know the attorneys a little bit for KSB who really talked about the thoughtfulness that goes in behind any um, changes that they make to policy and just the recommendations to keep us, um, you know, compliant with changes in state laws. And um, so I really appreciate the fact that, you know, we take these changes seriously and that we um, act on them quickly because, you know, I, I know we all want to do everything we can to make sure we're being compliant. Thank you for that. All right. Anyone else? Um, I'll just add, this is the policy that we're following state law, but I think the state law is a little wonky here um, with regards to the requirements for the permission slips from parents because we're dealing with anaphylaxis and um, asthma, which are, I mean, in any event. Time sensitive. Time sensitive, yep. yes. So um, <clears throat> that is one way to put it. Yes. Good so <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just like, I just would like to make a mental note as a board you know, to potentially revisit this as we look at what our advocacy platform looks like next cycle. Yep. All right. Ditto. Okay, good, good discussion. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Uh, 7 7.10, this is a, a second read of new board policy for student misuse of medication. So, uh, Dr. Hubbard. Yeah, policy JDDAB. Is rec um, KSB is recommending this new policy to address the gap in the student disciplinary framework related to students bringing and distributing prescription or over-the-counter medications. This change was not made in current policy JDDA regarding drug-free schools as policy JDDA very closely follows the language of federal law on drug-free schools. This new policy specifically addresses authority to discipline a student for misuse of medication. Again, it is a second read. I did not receive any um, suggestions for edit. Okay, motion to approve. I moved, Ashley. Second. Second, Borkman. Okay, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. And our last policy for this evening is a revision to food services management. Dr. Hubbard. Okay, policy EE, again a final read. KASB is recommending that districts adopt more detailed policy language on unpaid mill changes, excuse me, mill charges, in order to meet federal requirements. This policy balances federal requirements that school districts attempt to recoup unpaid mill debts with SMSD's priority to preserve the dignity of students and families that get behind on student mill payments. Move approval, Borkman. Thank you, second. Second, Garcia. Right, discussion? All in favor say aye. Oh, I just wanted oh, to say really yeah. quick on this. Um, yeah. I know that whoever's going through and doing the tedious work of capitalizing specific words that need to be capitalized, the journalism major in me really thanks you for that. So <laughs> it's Rachel. Uh, Rachel, it's Rachel. <laughs> huge thank you to Rachel because it just, I love it. So thank you. <laughs> We're getting closer. We've, we've approved a lot this it's year. It's so of great. Vision, so so yeah. great. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0 with, I think, an exclamation point on that one. <laughs> All right. Item 7.12, open enrollment building capacity. Sure. The yeah. finale. I know. This one's like, woof. I made it last on purpose. Uh, so I'm going to kick us off here. Um, I just want to remind everybody that um, Shawnee Mission has been taking out-of-district students for over 20 years. I can't even really come up with the date of how long that's been happening, but it's been happening for at least 20 years and maybe even closer to 30 years if we really dug deep. We had a great policy that was working exceptionally well. 
we did take a little uh, break of taking out of district school, or excuse me, out of district students when the funding formula changed to a block grant only because there was just no, we didn't get funded for them, which is why we didn't during that time. But um, I think it's worked really well for the Shawnee Mission School District for many years and we have amazing out of district kids that join us every day in our schools. I'm really nicely trying to say we had a process that was working. And now we have a state statute that requires that is requiring this board um, item tonight. And so in accordance with Kansas law, 72-3123 and board policy JBCD, which we had to approve earlier this year, um, regarding non-resident students and their enrollment in the Shawnee Mission School District. So that's why we're here tonight. Again, I just want to say we had a great policy that was working. And I also just want to point out, because I can feel like I can take this opportunity to do it, this um, state statute has created hours upon hours of school resources and manpower to create this report, not just in Shawnee Mission, but all of our neighbors are doing that currently, and I just think that's sad considering we had a really great policy that was working. Now I'll go on to business. My apologies. Um, this report will give you a capacity for each grade level in each, uh, each school in this school district, the estimated number of students expected to attend school in the Shawnee Mission School District, the estimated number of open seats available during open enrollment in each grade building and or program, and enrollment projections. So I'm going to start with our elementary schools. And elementary capacity was defined as follows. So um, as most of you all know, we have district class guidelines for Shawnee Mission in regards to K2 being 22 and 3-6 being 25. Pre-K is not addressed in this report because they are not part of the um, state statute. It's only a K-12 application, and so we did not include pre-K here. Um, I want to remind everybody that pre-COVID, we were 24 and 27, and we may eventually be back there, but for now and for the, um, the purposes of this report, 22 and 25 at the elementary level. Factors that we considered in the elementary title schools. So um, in kindergarten classroom enrollment, we said we were not going to exceed 18, first and second grade, not to exceed 19, and not to exceed third through sixth grade. Again, specific to out-of-district, non-resident enrollment. And then factors in our other elementary schools, we did 19 at kindergarten, 20 at first and second, and 23 at third through sixth grade. Um, our optimal maximum capacity elementary size, you've heard us say this numerous times over the last 10 years in regards to boundary changes, but we really like to keep those elementary schools at 550 for multiple reasons. Um, but staffing is probably the number one reason. Well, that's not true. Staffing and then just the ideal um, knowing students, relationships with students, you know, cars lined up six blocks deep from our families, just all of those factors. We feel like 550 is really the optimal max capacity we'd like for our elementary schools to be at. So um, we are closing buildings to non-resident students for any building over 525 so that we don't reach that. Uh, optimal max. Um, the following elementary schools are closed due to capacity and or um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in regards to why Belinda, Briarwood, Brook Ridge, Corinth, Prairie, Tomahawk, Westwood View. You may notice that of the seven, six of them are in the east feeder pattern. Two of those, Briarwood and Tomahawk, are specific to the boundary change that just um, occurred there. Anytime we make a boundary close, we usually will close those schools for a couple of years just so they settle in and we see what the actual enrollment comes out to. But in addition to that, um, Indian Hills is currently right at capacity. And if you look at our enrollment projections for the next five years, um, in two, we do our own. Allison, um, as Russ mentioned earlier, does some projections for us. And she uses data like live birth data um, in, in Johnson County, just some matriculation rates that we've seen um, historically in the Shawnee Mission School District. And then we also paid for a enrollment study, I believe two years ago, from RSP and Associates. And both of those projections tell us that Indian Hills is only going to continue to 
um, exceed that optimal maximum at our middle school level. And so we can't continue to allow transfers into the east side if our middle school on the east side is at capacity. And so therefore, that is why you will see every elementary school in the east feeder pattern closed. All right, so I'm not gonna go through all 27 of these other elementaries, but I am gonna go through the first one and the second, just so you can kind of see the pattern of uh, what we were looking at. So first of all, you'll see Apache, which is a title school. Um, the first line there are the 24-25 staff sections. So in kindergarten, we'll have four teachers, uh, first grade four teachers. Obviously, if we had a ton of move-ins, that could potentially change. And, and I would say at the beginning of every school year, we may add, I don't know, three to five throughout the year sections district-wide. So one section in this building could change or not, but um, it's, it's not. At, when you count the number of sections we have, three to five is a really small percentage of sections that uh, we just didn't get right. Our, again, our classroom staffing, the 22 and 25. Uh, matriculation, new and district enrollment safeguard. We, we talked about this safeguard that we put in place um, at the 18, 19, 22 levels. Um, we did that so that we left ourselves plenty of room to allow for new move-ins as well as just kids matriculating through the system. So um, that leaves non-resident seats, as you can see there on the bottom line, 21 seats at Apache. And um, we we hope that we got it right, that this doesn't have us hiring any new staff members. Um, again, this is our first go at it. We'll see how it goes, and um, if we need to change for next year, we will. But we felt like we gave ourselves some really good safeguard procedures in place to um, take as many out of districts as we can without having to having an impact on staffing. And then on um, the next one is Benninghoven. You will see. Um, is a not not a title school, and so the only thing that's different on this one is the safeguards are a little bit different in this particular school. So that is um, all the elementary schools are listed by building, which is the requirement of the law. So all of those are there. Uh, we do have a lot of seats available in our elementary schools, um, with the exception of the East Side and Brookridge, that students could attend. Before we move to middle school, any questions about elementary? Michelle, I, I'm guessing, I'm noticing the safeguard is bigger for, larger for kindergarten than first through sixth. Is that just because it's much more of an unknown since we, we don't can't have predict it at all? Okay. And I think that's something that we could potentially change for next year. We just don't know enough, we just don't have enough information. And in the new um, legislation, it looked at, there's a chance this could change to April, I'm sorry, to January. Now it's in April we have to give this, that it would, the window would actually open in January, and it'll even be much more harder per, to predict, which means the safeguards will probably need to go up even higher. But we won't know that until we just have a general idea of how many applications we get and then how good we were at predicting. Thank you. Anything else for elementary? All right, middle school, I'm gonna to turn to David Stubblefield. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard. Um, you know, kind of like Dr. Hubbard mentioned, just a tremendous team effort, lots of hours were poured into this. I wanna specifically thank uh, our HR directors, uh, Ms. Pam Lewis, uh, Dr. Jeremy Higgins, also our uh, directors of elementary and secondary services, Chris Darby, uh, Chris Slow, and Dr. Sherman, again, for spending lots of time looking at projections, looking at open seats in all of our schools. Again, just a tremendous uh, lift. Also our ELT uh, cabinet members, uh, specifically uh, Rachel England, who uh, spent a lot of time advising uh, and, and drafting a lot of this information. And of course, uh, David Smith's team for putting this together and making it look really pretty. Thank you. All right, so uh, if we're looking at middle school numbers uh, in terms of class size guidelines. <clears throat> this number was determined by looking at the class range optimum class guidance for ELA classes that the district provides to schools. So this is not a number that we just kind of guessed on. This is kind of a number that we have used uh, quite a bit and, and have gone back to in terms of, of just kind of where those class sizes are gonna land. 
Uh, so the class range or optimum class guidance has been in place for a number of years. And currently the optimum class size for middle school ELA classes is 27. And you're probably asking, why ELA? Well, the ELA class range optimum class guidance was used because every student is required to take an ELA course each and every year. So that's where we land on that number. Uh, if you looked at some of the factors that, that we considered, if you look at the title schools, uh, the optimum class size for ELA was 27. And what we'll do is for a title building, uh, we'll um, subtract three um, from that, which was used to determine the open seats, which ends up being uh, 25 um, and then, or excuse me, 24. And then for our other schools that are non-title, uh, that number would be uh, 25. Okay, so, and then we, uh, again, looked at the optimum max capacity for middle school size, and that number is 875, and you're probably saying, well, why 875? Again, it takes into consideration, are we going to have to hire more staff? Uh, are we going to need an extra counselor? Do we need another principal? Uh, we, that 875 is kind of that uh, number that really allows a middle school building to operate efficiently and effectively. The number of lunches was a really big one. No. If you get into having yeah, you, <laughs> six or seven lunches, it just yeah. creates schedule. Yeah, you'll, you'll be serving lunch from, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning to, <laughs> to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so those, those were the numbers that we uh, started using, utilizing, uh, again, to, to kind of define um, capacity. I want to add to that. We really struggled with this middle school capacity and talked a lot about it, but we also talked about thinking about, generally speaking, we have about 2,000 kindergartners a year, anywhere from 1,900 to 2,000. So if you really want to keep your five feeder patterns somewhat aligned, you wouldn't want a middle school to get to 1,100 and another one to be at five or 600. And so thinking about that as well was yeah. another factor we considered. Yeah. And, and We'll discuss that a little bit later on as well. Uh, so if you look at just kind of, you know, kind of how we calculated this, uh, total number of sections, uh, classes able to be taught based on staffing, total number of seats needed um, for the students that are projected to be enrolled at each building, and then also the total number of seats needed for all students uh, based on class size maximum of uh, 24, 25, uh, depending on if you're a title or non-title uh, school building. All right, so if you look at this next slide, uh, we have one middle school that is going to be closed due to capacity. Uh, I, that, the current number of Indian Hills is 859 students, and then that is going to be projected to end up being, uh, for the 24-25 school year, uh, the projection is going to be 889 students. Again, that's why uh, we needed to uh, close Indian Hills. If you look at the next slide, we have Hawker Grove. Uh, so um, the staff sections was 209. If you look at the uh, pupil to teacher ratio, again, that optimum number, we decided it was gonna be 27. Uh, Hawker Grove happens to be a title school, so you subtract uh, three from that for the safeguard, uh, and then you'll end up with our uh, total non-resident seats available uh, for both seventh and eighth grade, uh, each being three seats. In contrast, we have uh, Indian Woods, which it would be a non-title school. Again, that optimum number uh, being 27 instead of the matriculation being three uh, and, and new enrollment being three, it is uh, set at two. Uh, and then our non-resident seats available for Indian Woods uh, Middle School would be for seventh grade five and for eighth grade, for eighth grade five. All right. That is middle school. Yeah. Any questions for middle school? Can I go back to elementary school? The list of the elementary schools, should Highlands be on that list as well? Okay. So there, there are eight oh. elementary schools. Yes. Okay. I okay. I'm, yeah, okay. Thank you. Can I ask a clarifying question? Um, if schools are closed, I'm assuming, I'm making an assumption, but I want to make sure I'm right here. If schools are closed for out of district 
enrollment. Are they also closed for in-district? So is sort of Briarwood, Indian Hills, Brook Ridge, et cetera, they're also closed for in-district transfers? Correct. Well, Just for clarification, they weren't necessarily this year. Oh. Because we hadn't created this, right? And so we've had a lot of discussion about that. But moving forward, we would need to follow the same procedure. Thank you. All right, moving to high school. Uh, so if you look at high school, again, um, we use that. Uh, the number was determined by looking at the class range, optimum class guidance for ELA classes uh, that the district provides to schools. Uh, currently, the optimum class size for high school ELA classes is 28. Uh, if you look at our, um, when you're looking at the, that class uh, range, optimum class guidance was used because every student is required to take an ELA course. Uh, the optimum class size for ELA, 28 minus 2 was determined for the number of seats. Subtracting two students from the optimum was utilized to account for natural matriculation of students into our district throughout the year and the need to have seats available for these current students. This also accounts for and allows for variance across our content areas. So again, we're going to be using that uh, optimum number of 28 and then we'll for high schools, uh, we'll use that, uh, subtracting that two for uh, matriculation. Uh, our optimum max capacity for high school size is 1,900. And then capacity was defined again for our high schools, total number of sections, classes able to be taught based on staffing, total number of seats needed for the students projected to be enrolled in each building, and the total number of seats needed for all students based on class size maximum of 26. All right, so here we have uh, Shawnee Mission East High School. Uh, we have the pupil to teacher ratio of 28, subtracting that two for matriculation and new in district enrollment safeguards, and we end up with uh, non resident seats available, three at each grade level 9, 10, 11, and 12. All right, uh, in comparison, we have Shawnee Mission North High School. Uh, their staff sections uh, were 397. The pupil to teacher ratio would be uh, 28. Uh, matriculation into the district uh, would be two. And those total non-resident seats available for uh, Shawnee Mission North would be 12 in the ninth grade, nine in the 10th grade, 12 in the 11th grade, and nine in the 12th grade. All right, any questions for high school? Oh, Ms. Yes. Um, and so just for clarification purposes, students who are already transferred, this does not impact anyone's placement right now. This is just moving forward for next year. That is correct. Given the complexity of this, if people have questions, I think we go ahead with questions rather than waiting for motion. So if anybody else has questions, I think I'd rather go a little bit off parliamentary procedure. Thank you, moment. Dr. Sinclair. Yeah, Ms. Borgman. It. Yeah, thank you. Um, how on earth, if there's two seats, how do you pick who gets the two? <laughs> so there are some guidelines. It's in the report about um, siblings and staff students receive priority. And then um, after that, it's truly a lottery, random lottery. State law defined how we have to do yes, it. Yes, right, it yeah. is. It's all in this. It's actually in the policy that we approved, I believe, in January. But um, military, foster it, children. It's one hundred percent defined in state statute. I would also like to remind everybody that prior to enrollment and to remain as a out of district, excuse me, a non resident enrollment or an out of district or an in district transfer, you have to remain in good standing. All right, district programs, special education, Sherry. 
Good evening. So the next three slides have, are a breakdown of our special education um, centralized programs. I do think it's important to note that given our ongoing staffing challenges and our high volume of increase of student needs, we are closing those special education programs just due to the unpredictable nature um, of, of needs um, that we um, already have or um, would have with families um, moving into our district. So at this time, though, it is recommended that those programs would remain closed. Um, I'll stand for any questions. I mean, there's a list of all of the locations, but I don't know if you have questions specifically about um, the special education services. Yeah. And so this is, sorry, that's okay. I was, I thought the yeah was yes, for me. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, that okay. was a little informal. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> And so just for just to clarify, so these are like the the centered programs that are at specific elementary schools, um, and those and the enrollment capacity for those programs is at capacity because we don't have the resources to bring in additional, Correct. and we don't know what enrollment for those programs looks like moving forward, and we are also somewhat understaffed still with regards to paraeducators and all of that stuff. But this does not apply to special education services or students receiving those services like in a, who do not need a centralized um, like program in a building. So if your kid, if you're wanting to apply for an in-district transfer and your child utilizes special education services that is just, you know, I don't, I, just, not in need of I a just centralized, remind, centralized program. I want to remind everyone we're talking about, the, tonight we are talking about non-resident students. Yes, I understand okay. that. Okay. So, so I'm not in district transfer. Correct. So. I'm talking about students transferring in. So if there's someone, say, out of district who wants to transfer in, their child use, utilizes special education services, they can still apply for the transfer and be selected to, according to the lottery process laid out in statute. But for students who would need to receive services that require a centralized locations programs, those are what is at capacity. So like if you were wanting to utilize the SLC services at Tomahawk, that is at capacity and so it's closed to transfer students. You, yes, okay. you, you are correct. Um, now I would say that that would also be contingent upon that building level capacity um, that we viewed previously, right? So um, you, you would have to meet those other requirements. So it would have to be, let's say, a second grader at this particular building um, for those, not again, non-residents. Our numbers, as you can imagine, are very fluid throughout the school year um, with identifications happening at all points of the school year. Uh, in addition to um, new, new move-ins, um, new relocations, um, or new circumstances that may warrant um, an eligibility for special education. I also want to remind individuals that um, Special education does include gifted services as well, um, and we all have seen a significant higher volume of gifted identification and the capacity of our gifted programs are included. While listed on these slides, um, sometimes it is not always interpreted that gifted is um, under that special education umbrella. So they are included in those centralized programs in their feeder capacities. Okay, um, and so then that leads me to a follow-up question. If you are if you are an out of district individual and you transfer in to our district and then later down the line needs are identified, you are our student at that juncture and we are incorporating you into our enrollment numbers. This is a factor for enrolling directly into a program, not coming into the district and then a need being identified later. We, we would continue to have all obligations as it relates mm -hmm. to um, IDA requirements. And so if we had an individual um, move in and, and identified needs transpire, we would have an obligation to not only identify, but then serve as well. So you, once you're here, you're ours. You are correct. Thank you. As long as you remain in good standing. Right, that part too. Yeah, okay, all right. So if I could add, so if um, a student is picked through the lottery system and has an IEP that would require one of these closed programs, we would be at capacity and not be able to take that student. Okay. Um, okay. 
Where are we at in our presentation? Are we ready for motion? Or we have more? No, not yet. Not yet. I've got more. I've got more. <laughs> a little bit more? But wait, there's more. more. A little bit more? Okay, so uh, if we get to our signature programs, um, our district signature programs, whether uh, here at CAA or at the CTC, uh, you know, capacity is based on some of the following things where class size, they're based on staffing and space limitations, obviously. Uh, also, uh, SMSD enrollment based on class requests as of uh, February 21st of this, of this year. And uh, re we reserved back two seats for each high school uh, in each entry level uh, course uh, that we offer. Um, that way, again, uh, providing for those opportunities for students that move in uh, to Shawnee Mission that actually establish residence uh, here, um, they can uh, have, a, we have a seats available for those folks. Uh, so if you look at the closed, uh, our closed sections for our signature programs, uh, you'll see all 23 of, of, of these programs that are closed. And if you look at our, the next page on here, uh, these are typically the ones that are, again, our entry level programs that we've uh, had some seats available. So um, I don't need to read this slide for you. If you have any questions in terms of our signature programs, I will be happy to. Um, okay. So have, I'm sorry, can I jump in with a question? Um, the, so our growth in uh, the enrollment in signature programs has grown over time as students learn more about that. So was that part of kind of factoring in, um, a, a, assuming there's going to be some internal national natural growth to these programs? Yeah, that's correct. So again, we'll have, uh, we, we have some seats available um, in terms of growth, but these seats are that you, that you see now, the ones that we closed were definitely due to uh, staffing, space limitation, and what our current Shawnee Mission students had already said they were going to enroll in for next school year. Okay. This is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Wow. So just blows my mind. Yes. Uh, this is a lot of work. So with the CAA programs, we are almost at capacity for that just for our internal students, are we not? Like that's already, I mean, it's a full program for like. In some cases, we're, oh, we have we're waiting lists. Yeah, we have waiting lists. Mm -hmm. Correct. We don't, like all of the kids in district who want to participate in those programs. So this slide you able. see right now are our yeah. programs that tend to have, like plant and soil, it's new, it's brand new. So right. it will continue to grow likely, but. Yeah. Um, all of these are our smaller in numbers okay. um, programs. Yeah, I mean, some of our popular programs, again, have those waiting lists that we can't get some of our own students in into. Okay. Uh, I, I just can't resist making a couple of observations about this. First, the elegance of this plan is just amazing. I mean, if you want to look at talent and, and uh, precise execution in a way that is really breathtaking, just look at what has been put together here. This is so uh, overwhelmingly uh, wrapped with red tape and bureaucracy. The two things the state lawmakers love to complain about, and then they adopt rules that cause us to go through this red tape and bureaucracy to respond to those to those statutes. And when we do it, we do it with this kind of elegance. And it makes it look like it's simple. It is not. I mean, my compliments to the staff. And I picture this in my mind with little strings underneath all the little dots on the page. Every time you pull one dot to a different place, you cause tension on the whole system. Mm -hmm. it, the, every single move is related to every single other move. And the impact on staff at the building level is only uh, vaguely referred to here, not because you're trying to keep it from us, but it's true. I mean, this can be an administrative nightmare, um, all because school choice is something that uh, lawmakers want to embrace with a kind of passion that makes me feel like they're kind of cynical about it when you see the implications of how we have to execute something like this. So it is ironic to me that the very folks who complain about bureaucracy create it 
when they adopt a law like this and require us to engage in this, and yet you do it with this elegance. So, you know, you, your talent is admirable. I wish it could be deployed in more constructive ways. <laughs> and I don't mean this is unconstructive. I get it. I mean, this is really, it's got equanimity. It's got clarity. It's got direct uh, simplicity. It, people can understand this. They have to study it a bit, but they can understand this. But it's overwhelmingly uh, well done, and I wish you didn't have to do it. So that takes us to the final part that has to be approved for um, this Kansas State statute, and that is our proje projections for the 24-25 school year. So you will see, again, the 24-25 elementary projections for elementary, middle school, and high school. And that concludes the report. I, I do want to add that um, I think we are all very hopeful that we gain some amazing out-of-district kids. We already have a lot of out-of-district kids, so whether they be uh, staff members' kids or siblings of kids that came in prior to um, prior to this state statute. We, again, Shawnee Mission has been taking out-of-district kids for a long time. I want to be clear, we're trying to change our language, and I just did it like four times right there, but this is really about non-resident students versus out of district, because the statute is very specific to the word non-resident, so we're really working to try to change our own um, language there. We're all struggling with that, but we'll get there. And so at this time, we would stand for any questions all right. that you, we haven't already had. Okay. So for this, um, well, I think we should do a first and second maybe before we have any other discussion. So can, can we do real quickly oh. um, for statute purposes? I, um, our attorney suggested I actually read the full recommendation. Oh, so full recommendation. I, can I do that really we, quickly? That's what we move. So I'm you're going to read the full recommendation, and that would be our motion. Well, for someone would need a motion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I make a motion for Michelle's whatever she's about to say. <laughs> Well, I want to recommend we'll approval of the attached enrollment report. And I, just because we had um, in the presentation we missed Highlands, I want to be clear that we're approving the report, which does include Highlands, but the report is what we are approving, not the presentation, including enrollment projections, the capacity for each Shawnee Mission school, the pupil-to-teacher ratio, and the number of open seats available for non-resident students in schools and district programs for the 24-25 school year. Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Thank you. Second? Second, Hembry. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? I, I had just an overarching question, which I know is a big one here, but um, it's hard not to look at this and not start thinking more big picture around capacity of the district. And I'm curious what kind of, com and I'm, the exercise of having to do this is very unfortunate, especially when we had a system that was working and that was meeting our needs and meeting the needs of um, non-resident non students. Um, but I'm curious what kind of like conversations or ideas it might have prompted, because seeing where so much of our growth is and hearing about so many of our signature programs that are at capacity, it's definitely, for me, sparking a bigger thought around capacity of the district. Well, generally speaking, I'm going to go back to the previous bond, um, the bond we're concluding right now. The first, I believe we started this in 2019, we did a capacity study, and I'm going to define capacity a little differently. Um, we defined capacity for every building in the district on how many students they would actually hold based on the number of classrooms they had, not this capacity is based on staffing, right? That capacity report, which we still have, is based on physical space capacity. So, I mean, we have elementary, we have an elementary school that will hold over a thousand kids, but ideally we don't want an elementary school with a thousand kids there. Um, in regards to middle school, that's our tightest capacity in my opinion. Our high schools will hold well over 2,000 kids fairly easily. Um, our middle schools don't have the same capacity. And I think that probably is, be this is just Michelle talking right now, I'm not, I don't want anyone throwing stones here, but I think that is because um, Shawnee Mission had, Dr. Neal help me, eight middle schools at it one time? Nine middle schools, or junior highs, and closed multiple um, 
of that level, whether it be 789 or 78. And so with us just having the five, our capacity is really tight at the middle level. So while we have a lot of capacity at the elementary, um, right now we have four middle schools that could still hold a lot of kids. We have one that can't. So, I mean, we could gain a lot of out-of-district kids here and be okay for quite some time in four of the five feeder patterns. Um, I, and I think we're all in agreement. We would love to see some um, amazing non-resident students apply and be accepted in our open capacity seats. Are you saying that the middle school capacity is a physical space issue more so than a staffing issue? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Helpful, helpful context. And as far as um, programming for our signature programs, um, you know, Hindsight's 2020, but I wish we would have built this space bigger. Because it's like fill the dreams you build and they will come. And that's exactly what happened here with these signature programs. And I know we talk about that in regards to the CTC and what our next steps are there. Um, yeah, and then I, you know, kudos to our HR team for the work that they do in terms of just being tightly staffed so that we're not wasting, you know, dollars on, you know, uh, just unneeded spaces and, and again, staffing to what our enrollment is, I think they do a really good job of that. And honestly, some non-resident students at the elementary level would actually help us be more efficiently staffed because with our guidelines like they are at a kindergarten two section building, if you know there's 44 kindergarten seats, let's say, and if we have 48 kids, that provides a lot of open seats. And so it would help us, if we could gain kids in those spaces where we have a lot of seats, it would really help us be more efficiently staffed. And it's out of our, I mean, it's out of our control. It's not like we can be more efficiently staffed, just the way kids fall at the elementary level and um, neighborhood schools. So we had all those, lots of capacity conversations in the last two weeks. <laughs> well, to add on to some just comment that I, I feel like one thing that has been pointed out here is that non-resident students, out of district students, whatever, they are welcome in Shawnee Mission and always have been. And the issue here is that there was a piece of legislation that was never a Kansas problem and it was not a Kansas bill. It was from a another ideology that was stuck on to the Kansas map. So with that, um, I think the, uh, you've handed us a tool that's very respectful and manageable and feasible. And so thank you for that. Um, all right. So I think, are we ready to vote? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. OK. Um, board comments, item 8.1. Would anyone like to share before we adjourn to executive session? Okay, I'm going to start with my left, Ms. Owsley, and then we'll work our way down. I am not sure that um, folks know what wigs are. Um, and just, it's wildly important goals. Is that correct? Okay. I just, uh, there wasn't an asterisk on one of the presentations that I was thinking about, it and I was like, I, if I didn't know. Just from our conversations, I don't know if people would know what a wig was, so I just right. wanted to clarify. Okay, and before I go to my right, Mr. Westbrook, did you have anything? Uh, I just want to observe that the R&D forum is coming up, and I look forward to it every year, and I'm really glad that it's going to happen at a time when the school board is going to have some sessions on strategy. That's exciting. I don't think that comment was accurate, Dr. Right? Sinclair, because we talked about... Um, May 2nd's not an R&D forum? No, R&D forum is over on the 27th. It, that's the end of it. The 27th mm -hmm. is the end. Okay. I, I misunderstood. No, right. I don't. Th I think we had it confused early on. But okay. okay. Well, I remain confused. That's okay. <laughs> it's the week <laughs> of the 24th through the 27th. The 23rd, Dr. Neal, help me. So we have public receptions next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 4 to 7 p.m., open to the public. We encourage everybody to come and see the amazing work that will be on display here. 
Okay. And then or, live pitch finals on the morning of April 27th okay. from 9 to 11.30 a.m. That's always really exciting. That'll also be live streamed. And then the award ceremony will be the afternoon of April 27th at 2 p.m. Thank you. All right, thank you for correcting that. My apologies. All right. Uh, Ms. Yeah, um, just a shout out uh, once again um, to Amber Pagan, who was chosen as the Region 3 finalist for Elementary Education for Kansas Teacher of the Year. Just, I mean, amazing. And then um, also Annie Hassan, just her work um, in foreign language at Shawnee Mission South. She's just so inspiring herself. And um, I know that my fellow board members were at NSBA um, during the um, Kansas Teacher of the Year Region 3 dinner, and, and so I, I could not attend that, and so I was very fortunate to get to attend the Kansas Teacher of the Year dinner, as I know many other board members would have loved to have joined me in that evening, but um, it was just really inspiring to see so many incredibly dedicated teachers from across our region just really in it for kids, and it was inspiring, and I just... I mean, Amber, Miss Pagan, to stand out amongst that group is just such an incredible feather in your cap, and we are so fortunate to have you in Shawnee Mission, and thank you for all you do for kids, and to all the other teachers that, you know, didn't get that recognition, you all deserve it, and um, we just thank you, especially towards the end of the year when things get hairy, so um, thanks, teachers, for all you do. We also have some prom coming up. Um, I know at Northwest, I'm not sure when the other events are and or other proms, but um, it really takes a ton of volunteers to, to hold after prom, which is such an incredible um, event for many high school students to keep them safe. And so thank you so much to all the parents out there that are willing to stay up all night um, to make sure that kids have a safe place to um, spend the rest of their evening. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Embry? Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment. This comes before us every year around the same time. Item 5.2 is our donations, and we approved receipt of almost $300,000 in donations for personnel from our PTAs. I am so grateful for all the work that our PTAs do. I'm so grateful for the support I give to my own PTA. I get it as a parent wanting to support your own kid's school, but when you really look at those numbers, 99.5% of that money is going to schools in a single feeder pattern in our area. And I did a little math and the free and reduced lunch is 9% in those schools compared to 40% district wide. And I think when we as a board talk about um, trying to equalize experiences for students around the district and leave a really big back door open for some big disparities between our schools, um, we have an obligation to call that out. So I just want to elevate. I know it's intractable. I know it's difficult. I also know we're, know we're the only district in the county that allows this kind of funding to happen. Um, we say one Shawnee mission, and to me, I think that means that we have some of those hard conversations as a board. So I would love to see this board have some real conversation about what it means to be allowing um, community-funded positions in our schools. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to give another shout out to Ms. Pagan. I know we're very lucky, lucky in the Neiman community and in the North area to have you um, in one of our schools, so congratulations. Also wanted to take a moment to express my deep gratitude that our board can sit here and articulate that in years past the culture has been maintained of having out of district folks come into our schools and have success. Many of my friends at Shawnee Mission North were not members of uh, the Johnson County community, and I was so grateful to know them as transfers, and it's, I know that's a part of our culture up there, and I know that's a part of the culture in Shawnee Mission, but I, I, I love the fact that we can recommit ourselves to understanding that a little bit deeper, and that what's in front of us, although it is not in our favor to have to do in the first place, I'm grateful to be in a school district, serve on a board of folks that uh, appreciate our folks from out of district, and looking forward to addressing the issues and concerns that come up, but also looking forward to experiencing all the great times to come with the kiddos that uh, end up in our homes and in our schools. Um, so looking forward to the future. Thank you. Right. And Ms. Boynerana, did I skip over you? Well, you We're good? Not. Okay. So that concludes our regular meeting for this evening. Um, we will adjourn to executive session and uh, we'll um,
conduct no further business. So at this point, could you read the motion to move us to executive session? And can you add a five minute break yes. between the end of, uh, or the start of um, executive session? That's right. So give us five minutes before we start. That's right. That work? So, okay. Am I, I'm sorry, I'm making it more complicated. So 857 and um, then. We can talk really slow and make it like even. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I move that we go into executive session to discuss personnel issues pursuant to the non-elective personnel exception under COMA. And the board will reconvene in this room at 9.30. At 9.30. We invite Dr. Hubbard, Dr. Gilhouse, Dr. Schumacher, Dr. and Dr. Stubblefield to join us. All right. Do I have a second? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries 7-0. And our next regularly scheduled meeting is May 13th. Thank you all. <laughs>